Oh. Oh. Ugh. everyone hello and welcome to a new episode of the screenplay archaeology podcast i am your host kiramid head and i'm whiskey brewer all the way from the sunny climes of the uk yes so sunny it's it's always cloudy <laughs> so so yeah that it, that's just the mist rising up the heat haze and all that that's just blinding everybody it's it, you, know, you know it's always cloudy in london <laughs> yeah you know if you ever <laughs> you start remaking our shows again I don't know. Well, we we may re- remake them better than um, you do ours, you know, with, well, like the coupling and the it crowd. Yeah, well, I mean, we we had um quite a few seasons of a superior office to make up for that, but you know, let's leave the rivalries aside. Oh, oh, oh! How you wound me, sir! You <laughs> wound me. But uh, to get on topic, uh, two years ago, which was your second episode, we did. An unproduced It script based on the Stephen King book to tie in with the first, you know, remake movie coming out. That's right, yeah, it was the David Kajanak draft. Yes, and he is the writer who has written quite a few of these Stephen King things that have gone unproduced. Oh, yeah, he's got got a massive King fetish. (laughs) He has. Yeah, because he's he's done Pet Cemetery, It, and The Stand. He goes for the epic. Oh, he's worked his way up the minute in Pet Cemetery to the epic in The Stand, essentially. Oh, yeah. Pet Cemetery is like the most, like, straightforward, unadorned narrative of King. (laughs) It is. There's not much, too much you can add without overloading it, really. Which we saw that happen in that. (laughs) Oh, God, yeah. But, um, but no, with, uh, Chapter 2 coming out, or having come out, as the case may be. Yeah. That's right. Because um, we, we, I, cause I decided I, was, I wasn't originally going to do these these scripts because I'm like, oh, these are actually pretty close to the movie. But I got a request from it over the um, the email address years and years back. And I said, OK, I'll do this when Chapter 2 rolls around. And I have forgotten who you are. I am sorry, but this episode is out now. Hopefully you enjoy it. Hopefully you got the word of my platform change between now and then. <laughs> That's true. Well, that's true. That's if he remembered he asked for this script. Yeah. <laughs> By this point, it's been that long. But hey, I said, hey, I'll do it in 2019 when Chapter 2 comes out. And I did. And so what we're doing tonight is it's going to be the early drafts of the 2017 movie directed by, uh, co-written by Kerry Fukunaga, who was supposed to direct. And of course, at the time, around this time, you know, he was just hot coming off of, uh, True Detective. True Detective. And True Detective, and he had just done the first Netflix original movie, Beasts of No Nation, before everybody started hating Netflix originals. Yeah, that's right. It's probably one of the few ones, that, and that all started the whole controversy between should Netflix films be Oscar-nominated and all this. And, you know, and now we, well, I mean, they, sh- they should at least get enough, they, they should at least get some sort of, you know, nominations for the effects work in Dark Crystal, just saying. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's beautifully done. Hens- Henson would be proud of that. Oh, he would be very proud of that. But, uh, I think, yeah, but we're going to be covering those drafts. And, uh, but before we jump into that, I'm just going to uh, get all my usual plugs out of the way. If you can remember all the sites that you you are um, stranded into, like the beams of the Dark Tower. Yeah, yeah, that is a thing. But um, but yeah, of course, you know, remember to if you if if you enjoy this, the, oh, bah, bah, fuck. Yeah, if you have any questions or concerns, you know, sh- shoot an email to screenplayarchaeology at outlook dot com. You, know, you can contact us on uh, Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, and I've also posted a blog and I post to a few other places. We're on all these podcast platforms now we're on we're on um itunes or whatever itunes is becoming in the coming months stitcher radio spotify google play music maybe pandora if they can bother to tell me whether or not we're in it <laughs> we're, we're on that one yet <laughs> and, you gotta love how they're keeping that a secret we're not gonna tell him it's gonna be a big surprise for him we're gonna yep. have cake and everything 
And if you like this show, you like the subject matter, also check out the Shelf Podcast and the Table Reads Podcast. And that latter one does fully, you know, they, they just read through the whole thing in complete, complete. They read through the complete script. Why can I not talk? <laughs> Who knows? Pennywise doesn't want you to speak. No, no, he doesn't. He's trying to turn me into Bill. <laughs> yeah. God, yeah. Or um, Stan in the second one. But, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, before we uh, get into the actual scripts themselves, I want to run through this really quickly because I don't want this to take up too much time. But, obviously, the book is fantastic. Oh, God, it's an epic read. It's, Christ, it's like a thousand pages, and it's worth every page. It's 1,100. Is it 1,100? Oh, it, God. It, it might be like, no, it might be like 1080 or something like that. I don't have, like, I would have to walk across the room and, like, dig for it behind some stuff, but it's <laughs> pretty long. Um, it's, I think it's only beaten, I think in terms of King's stuff, it's only beaten out in page count by the extended version of The Stand. Yeah, well, yeah, that's the only book that could beat it. I mean, not that he hasn't written other long stuff, but just not quite that. No, or if he has written long stuff, he split it up into <laughs> various things. Yeah, like the Dark Tower, but dumb too. Like that, that, yeah, oh yeah. And um, of course, you know, a lot of people know it from the adaptation into the 1990 <laughs> miniseries, which, while imperfect, I think they did a pretty good job, considering you know the being on. Being on network TV in 1990 isn't exactly conducive to the source material. No, and, and the budget they would have had at that point as well. The budget and the fact that ABC apparently had no faith in it whatsoever, and they kept cutting back the the amount of time they wanted it to be. They kept cutting back the budget, and they kept cutting back all this stuff, and to the point where George Romero was supposed to direct it, and he left. God, it does make you wonder why did they buy the rights to it if they were just gonna mess around with it like that yeah that's like one of like a, that that's like one of three king's things king things that a romero was supposed to do that never happened no that's the thing and yeah he, he had always he always had stephen king projects lined up that seemed to get ripped out of his hands because you know he was supposed to do the stand and then that fell apart because they couldn't get the script down to a reasonable line no yeah because that's when they were still trying to make it as a film at that point yeah and i think it was something like they <laughs> King, I think King said, like, his first draft was, like, 400 pages or something like that. God. Which is understandable, considering that material. But, uh... Um, yeah. But and then he was also supposed to direct Pet Cemetery, and it ran into problems, and he left. And almost as soon as he left, it got off the ground. Oh, he he didn't have the luck with studio films, did Romero. And it would have been interesting to see his version of it, although I'm just imagining... Fuckface uh, Captain Rhodes from Day of the Dead playing Pennywise. <laughs> that would be, that would have been intriguing casting at the least. But of course, you know, we ended up with uh, Tommy Lee Wallace, who directed one of the most underrated '80s movies, which was uh, '80s horror movies, which was Halloween Three. Oh yeah, it's and my he, jam that one. And he actually, and he did, he did a reasonably good job considering what he had to work with, and the fact that he apparently had to rewrite Part Two from scratch. I'm still a little fuzzy on what happened there. That was probably all to do with all the budget cuts and them cutting back everything. So they had to, you know, they might have done more with like the turtle and the macroverse stuff if he'd had the budget. Oh, it was you, just like, you know, Romero would have gone for. Oh yeah, <laughs> he would have gone nuts on that one. But yeah, it was just like, oh, what scenes have we got left over from part one that we didn't use? Yeah, we'll throw them in for flashbacks. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that, well, that's basically what they did in part two was that they had they had some leftover scenes. I'm like, you know, some of this stuff really should have been. In the first night of the miniseries. Yeah, I suppose it's one way to get people to come back for part two. Which they kind of ended up doing in the movies. So, uh, yeah, of course, you know, I was going to make that a segue, but of course we got to bring up Tim Curry. Oh, yeah. Oh, the legend. To the point where we don't even have to say anything about him. Everything has been said. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just Tim Curry. It was Pennywise. And for, for the min what the miniseries was, he had it spot on. Yeah, he, he's the one, him and Harry Anderson are like the two casting choices that just solidify the thing. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Uh, then, of course, then you have a Clark from The Thing showing up in there, connected to the last episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, gotta get, the, gotta get those links in. Like That's right, yeah, it is. It's just um, less beard on his face. Less beard and less screen time. 
Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but uh, no, so eventually so that was made something of a splash when it came out. It started that seemingly endless at the time, you know, parade of Stephen King miniseries, even adapting stuff that didn't need to be a miniseries. Like, like Langoliers, you could totally do as a movie. <laughs> as a movie. Oh, yeah. And it, it needed the budget for a movie. You could Tom, cut out half that exposition. Tommy Knockers, you could do as a movie. As a movie with um, a better cast, maybe. Yeah, without um, Princess Leia's adopted father. <laughs> yeah. Well, he wasn't too bad. He was probably the best of a bad lot in that. It, it, well, I mean, it wasn't really his fault. It was just not a great production. No. And not one of King's best books either, if I'm honest. <laughs> No, again, that was was during the height of his drug and alcohol phase. I think it was his first completely sober book. Ah, so he was still trying to find his feet again in that regard. Right, right, what writing without the crutch? Yeah, and I believe uh, he says he he looks back on Tommy Knockers as like it's it's way too obviously that he's he's drawing that the whole thing is just like a metaphor for addiction. Of course, and of course, we could go through all the miniseries, but we're not going to. No. There's too many. I don't even know exactly which ones are which at this point anymore. They do kind of morph into certain things. Because they have miniseries, TV series, films, I mean, sequels that were a name only. Because, I mean, like, the fucking miniseries thing ended, and then, like, seven, like seven years later, something was like, oh, yeah, Bag of Bones is a thing now. That's right, yeah. Because that, that was after Storm of the Century, wasn't it? The The miniseries? Yeah. The miniseries was like 2013 or something crazy like that. Bloody hell. Yes, that's way after Storm of the Century then. Storm of the Century was 99. You're kidding me. I am not kidding you on that one. No way. No. Yes, it was. But moving wow. on. Yeah. Eventually, you know, the you know, Warner Brothers had the rights and they... And, you know, between various home video releases of the miniseries, which on the latest ones, they stitch the two parts together, and I'm not really sure why they do that. No, again, because the version I've got of the It miniseries is the um, is a two-sided, it's a single disc, but it's two-sided DVD. And so, of course, you've got part one on one side, part two on the other. It's been a while since I've watched it, so I can't remember if the credits are there at the end of part one or how the start of part two was edited. But I, the only thing I remember from when I last watched it was put in part one or put on the disc in, watched it, got to the end of part one and thought, yeah, I'm going to go into part two now. And of course, go into the menu and there's no link for part two. And I'm thinking, have I lost the disc? <laughs> Am I going to have to go on Amazon or eBay or actually get off my ass and go into HMV and buy myself another copy? So I've got part two of this thing. So I just I get up all in a huff, go over to the DVD player, take it out, about to put it in the case. And I notice part two is on the other side of the sodding disc. (laughs) I'm like, I'm here now. I'm going to watch it. I can watch it now. I don't need to be angry anymore. It was around 2010 or so when Warner Brothers announced that they were going to do a feature film version of it, and that's where the Dave Kajanik script we covered ages ago comes into it, and he actually proposed the idea of doing two movies, splitting it across the kids and the adults, but whoever was in charge said, no, you gotta do both sides of the story in one movie in about 130 pages, and he tried, bless his heart. Oh, he did. With with all the restrictions he had, it was quite coherent and didn't involve time travel or something. Yeah. I, I, I remember that, and with what he had to work with, he did remarkably well. It would have been an intriguing film, but I think it was better we got the two films, the kids and the adults. Well, it's a be- well, much better way of doing it. Well, it would, I will say it was at least better that we got that first movie. <laughs> yeah, well, of course, yeah. But, uh, but I mean, it, I mean, he did the best he could, and eventually it kind of got passed over to New Line. And they were the ones who hired Kerry Fukunaga, and that brings us to the scripts. Yes. Now, the basic, I, I, I've gotten in trouble before for not giving, well, well, trouble, more like people whining at me for not giving a uh, a quick plot <laughs> synopsis before we read it. It's basically the movie, it's set in the late 80s across a summer, and you have, like, the seven kids coming together to combat, you know, the shape-shifting it monster, which likes to take the form of uh, Pennywise the Clown. Yeah. 
and, and how just, they're the only ones who can stop it and it's they band together to fight their fears it's basically that's it and it's and these drafts are more or less pretty similar to the first movie that we got just more minute changes or different but just swapped around and just like like it would be edited differently based on the scripts than what we got with it chapter one yeah certain things were changed around and fukunaga kind of had his own approaches to stuff and we will get into the possible reasons why he was let go way later on oh yeah well, i think we'll save that for the um for the end <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. definitely it, it, it's worth building up to dear god but, uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I'll quickly say before we jump into the script, first movie, really good. Chapter two, uh, I mean, you've not seen it yet, right? No, uh, yeah, I still haven't seen it yet, no. Yeah, it's got moments in it where it absolutely nails the emotional beats. Then there's other moments where I'm like, what the hell are you guys doing? But uh, I'm not going to go in, into any further detail. Nah. We don't you, need to worry about spoilers at this point. I mean, I would probably, I mean, I would probably put it over that Pet Cemetery remake we got earlier this year, but that isn't really saying much. That's kind of damning with faint praise. Yeah, but the Paint Cemetery, yeah, Pet Cemetery was very different, very different to uh, the source material and the film, the original film. Well, my 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 problem wasn't with it being different. My problem was with it just being stupid. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> fair enough, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, let's do this stupid dumbwaiter thing. That, that was an interesting change, but yeah, it did, it did seem a bit out of left field, that one. Yeah, but that's a whole other story. I got two Pet cemetery scripts we can do in the future, so. Yeah, I'll, yeah I'll, I can keep those, like, my, you know, my alien stuff and my king stuff, <laughs> you know, and, and then the then the one-offs like Commando 2 and all that. And the Richard Stanley stuff, which we have put off doing those scripts for so long, he actually made another movie. <laughs> yeah, the cheeky son of a bitch. <laughs> okay, so jumping into the first script that leaked out, of course, who knows, there might have been one before it, There, and there could have been, you know, one, there would have been a few in between the two we're talking about, or even maybe a couple after, we don't really know. You know, there's loads and loads of drafts get written and tweaked and played around with during, you know, development. Yeah, because yeah, they'll come in and change just a couple of pages at a time just to shore up little bits. And then somebody will come in and go, oh, I'm going to do something completely different. But in fact, at least with these, there are a through line. So, In fact, there's certain um, shooting scripts where the revisions were all done on different colored pages. And sometimes there's so many revisions that scripts are basically like a big rainbow. God, it's the uh, Jason and his t amazing Technicolor script. Oh, yeah. And so the first draft, interestingly, it doesn't indicate that it would be part one of two on the title page. But then again, the movie didn't do that. No, that's right. It was only the um, it's only on the DVDs and all that after and, it is and chapter it's one. Even, it's not even on the cover. No, it no, says that's it, true. It says it. It says that the, the title card at the end says chapter. That's right. Yeah. And that was a surprise when I saw it. Uh, right, yeah. I suppose that's their way of... We've told a complete story, but if you want to see more, we'll do that in a couple of years. Don't worry if this does well. Yeah, of course. It's written by Chase Palmer and Kerry Fukunaga. Palmer, I'm not hugely familiar with his work, but he did write a very good unproduced version of Dune, which is a oh, nice. future episode material. And it's dated, it's a studio draft dated March 18th, 2014. So this is like a month after True Detective wrapped up. That'd been right. Yeah, he would have moved straight into it from, from that. And it starts off and it's relatively similar to the movie you have, as he's called here, Will Denbro. Bit of a random change. The first of several. Yeah. Oh God, yeah. And it's him and, and Georgie, they're making the uh, the paper boat in what's called his attic playroom. And the time frame is a bit different to the movie and the later draft we're going to be talking about, because here, instead of taking place across 88 and 89, it starts in October 87 and then continues on to the summer of 88. Yeah, it's one of those changes when they think they're going to make it quicker, so they'll just alter the years. And, of course, we're going to have to talk about some... Uh, Potential casting as we go along here. Supposedly, uh, Fukunaga's choice for Will was uh, Ty Simpkins from Iron Man 3, among other things. Which could have been interesting casting at the time. And of course, now, I mean, he's gotten so much older, people saw him in uh, in um, that, that, that little epilogue in Endgame and went, who the fuck was that? 
Uh, I was one of them. I was like, is it who? What? And in fact, you had to read it online to figure out who it is. It's like, oh my God, that's a nice callback. And it's just like... And it's like, all I remember seeing him in, in between those, was was uh, Jurassic World, and he's probably one of the least necessary characters in that movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he was in that. And that was, um, again, that yeah, he obviously just shot up in between those. And so while this is going on, he's sending, you know, Will's sending Georgie into the basement to get the paraffin. And we also, we get introduced to Richie Tozier here, who's um, talking over the walkie-talkies from across the street. And Richie, at the time, he still would have been Finn Wolfhard, which is interesting to think about. Well, yeah. Last thing about that, he, he's probably one of the few initial Fukunawa castings that stayed the whole way through. And this would, yeah, this would have been before straight, the first season of Stranger Things, wouldn't it? Yes. In fact, the it getting delayed is what allowed him to go and do Stranger Things in the interim. And then when Stranger Things hit big, he was like, yeah, we've got to have him. And everyone thought, yeah, he's perfect casting. He was like, I've done it before, guys. <laughs> well, yeah, well, he was he was actually cast officially in the movie they were making before Stranger Things was even out. Yeah. So it's just like, yeah, they officially kept, yeah, they just kept stringing him along. It's like, oh, now you finished that. We'll officially cast you now. Get some name brand recognition on this thing. And now, uh, I can't actually remember if that thing of them talking over the walkie-talkies is in the movie or not. I don't think it is. No. No, I don't. No, it's it's not. Because I think in the film, they cut out this whole thing about Richie being a neighbor or being across the street. That's not in the movie. Yeah, I guess it's not. But, okay, so moving on, Georgie, you know, he's about to go into the basement, and when the lights won't turn on, we introduce this thing that's sort of a a running thing through the different scripts where uh, where Will and Georgie have this call and response thing that they do to each other, where they make like a noise and they respond back with a different noise. It's not specified here, but it's setting up for kind of an interesting suspense moment later on. Yeah. it's Yeah, it's an interesting little thing. Obviously, it was something they would have had the um, Will and Georgie, the actors, come up with themselves. So it's like way to bond them during the making of it. Yeah, then so um he goes down into the cellar and and like you get then the whole idea of him you cause there's this whole thing in the book where Georgie thinks there's a monster in the cellar and they kind of plug up that a little bit here where in the movie they do the thing where he sees like these two reflections and he thinks they're eyes at first, whereas here it's like it's like a POV that's just watching him from the corner. Yeah. Which I think is a creepier, more visual thing to do. It is, it's a it's a lot better and it does slowly ratchet it up in this little prologue. Yeah, and as he's uh looking through the shelf for the uh for the paraffin, he finds a um, a can of turtle wax and starts looking at the cartoon turtle with hypnotic wonder as it says. Ooh, all in a send. Ooh, it's Easter eggs and ooh, will they do anything more with it? Probably not. Spoilers, <laughs> they fucking don't. <laughs> yeah, for Christ's sakes, and that was the big thing everyone was talking everyone wanted, and it's just like, ah, uh, for fuck's sake, Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, it, I'll say that this is not a spoiler because this doesn't mean anything. But the most you get is you get the Lego turtle in chapter one. And you yeah. get, there's a, there's a random like taxidermy turtle standing on like a teacher's desk when Ben goes back to visit the school as an adult. I'm like, who the fuck let this random grown ass adult into the school, even if it is over the summer? <laughs> yeah. Did they have him sign in at the front desk or anything? Or why is there actually anybody in the school over the summer? Hey, well, no one is actually there. Like the building's empty, but I'm just imagining this guy going, "Like, hey, Miss Miss Secretary, I got hot. Want me to show you my abs?" <laughs> <laughs> which there, there's a scare scene in the movie, which I swear is this because they 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 play with the idea of like the scar coming back. Oh right, yeah. But it turns into like, but it's not the way it is where like suddenly he has a scar. It's more like he starts getting. Like there's like a scene where they're like where like you can't see Pennywise like carving the name into him, and it seems like it only exists so this guy can lift up his shirt. <laughs> yeah, it's like, God, hey, seriously, I lost weight. Look at this. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to. You just think, yeah, you expect that from chicka wham wham music to start playing in the background or something. And it, what's interesting is that this actually seems to confirm that it is actually lurking in the basement and watching Georgie. Which, which intrigues, like, which keeps with this whole thing, it's un still underground. Yeah. Kind of thing. 
and the basement, of course, comes back later, just like it does yeah. in the movie. Yeah, which is always, always good. At least they kept that. Yeah, that was one scene we can tell they looked at it anyway. We don't want a monkey. No. That's going to be some classic stuff there. So Georgie goes back upstairs. Him and Will, they uh, they, they make the boat. And did I mention Will does not stutter? No, you hadn't done, mentioned that, no. Yeah, no, he doesn't stutter at all in these drafts. Like, he's, he stutters once under pressure in, like, the second draft we're going to talk about. But other than that, he's just so, normal. And you think that's meant that's meant to be a big part of his character in the books and in the original miniseries and in the film, actually. It's part of why he's one of the losers. Yeah, and, and McAvoy does the stutter pretty well in Chapter 2. Yeah, that's all right then. And so, you know, we get the scene of Georgie, you know, you know, you know, floating the paper boat out on the street. And one minor little difference is that instead of running face first into, the, I think it's called, what was it called? Like a sawhorse? Yeah, I think something like that, yeah. Yeah, instead of that, here he uh, slips and falls. Which makes sense with the amount of rain that's described in in the script as well. And in the book, because, like, I mean, it makes... It makes the book makes dairy sound like just a soggy hellhole. <laughs> it does, yeah, because it does in the in this draft it does mention that the saw horses, but they're just there. So they obviously thought, oh, in the film they said, oh, we might actually do something with that. And of course, and now in um, and of course, you know, it goes into the drain, and he meets Pennywise here. And what's interesting is that he's described as. It says, eyes peer back at him from the greasy white face of a clown, not Bozo or Ronald McDonald, but something more old world freakish, like that of a 19th century acrobat, bald, lithe, almost childlike, meet Pennywise, a.k.a. Bob Gray. Yeah, and it's the only one of the few times he's actually referred to as Bob Gray. That's something that was cut as well. Yeah, it's it's in the, this. It's pretty much the only time in this draft. The second draft does a little bit more with that. Yeah. That's, oh God. Yeah, it does. Yeah. But also the way he's described, it's basically the look we got. In- yeah, that's true. Actually, it's, it is quite a distinctive description. So you'd think let's stick with that. It is enough of a difference between, you know, from Tim Curry's Pennywise. Yeah, it is visually distinct. And at the time, the casting for Pennywise was Will Poulter. <laughs> Which, now that would have been quite funky. Yeah, it would have been interesting to see because I mean he's kind of been growing as an actor the last few years. It's kind of, it would be interesting to have seen what he would have done with it. Well, yeah, that's the thing here because a lot of people would only remember him from either Voyage of the Dawn Treader or We're the Millers. All twelve people who saw Voyage of the Dawn Treader, and I'm one of those twelve. <laughs> I, I saw about twenty minutes of it, and I was watching it on demand in a hotel room. And I got to the fucking, like, sneak attack magic ninja fog coming up and killing some people in the lifeboat. And I'm like, what the fuck am I watching? <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, yeah, of course, that is actually quite early in the film, yeah. And, um, and yeah, and of course, you know, I'm just, after Midsummer, I'm just imagining him pissing on a random tree and <laughs> some, some Swedish guy running going, ooh, you're pissing on my grandmother. <laughs> only this time, it would, only this time it would be Bill Skarsgård. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, they're not going to float if you piss on them. Yep. <laughs> and so the um, he has a little conversation with Pennywise, and here it's a lot shorter than it is in the book or the movie, and even the later draft. Yeah, this is very much sort of like very streamlined and just sort of, we want to get to this bit quickly. We want this quick visceral thing to happen, and you're going to be shocked by it. Yeah, and so Pennywise grabs him with what's described as an unusually long arm and a claw-like hand, and you know Georgie's getting like he's just thrashing around in the um, in in the drain as Pennywise is trying to drag him in. Now, in this version, he doesn't, and so he's known to be dead. Yeah, it just it says he's trying to pull him through the metal grate as this old woman is either watching, not watching, or feeding her cat. Yeah, and it cuts from Georgie thrashing around in the gutter to the cat just chew- chowing down on tuna, which is just a great image. That is, that's it's a cut, it's a cut they use that has been used quite often in a lot of like horror films, but here it is that quite sort of um, you know, obviously some women like think of think of some cats as their kids. It's like, well, she's feeding her kid, somebody else's kid is getting fed to something. And it's just like, yeah, and so you know, like. 
it cuts ahead to June 1988, and we get the abattoir scenes, which are with Mike and his father, which are pretty much the same as the movie, only here it's his father and not his grandfather, like it is there. Yeah, which I thought it is, and it's an interesting change in that regard. The fact it's you know it it's like it's adding more familial stuff to it, and also trying to distance Mike from the rest of the town. And it goes a little bit more into the uh, the parallel between the sheep in the abattoir and the people in the town. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, yeah, because obviously Mike's dad doesn't want him to have anything to do with the public school and all that. Saying, you know, humans aren't raised to be food. I think is the line. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, and like Mike or automatically knows that <laughs> his dad's kind of lying on that one, but it's his dad. He's not going to call him out on that one. All right, and so from there we go to the the last day of school scenes, which are all pretty much exactly the same as the movie. Like, some of the dialogue is different, and we get introduced to all the different characters here. And the first detail that you notice is different is that Eddie, instead of having a uh, an inhaler, he has an EpiPen. Which, it's an odd change. Yeah, it makes... It's- it makes the it makes the whole placebo thing even more fucked up because he's poking holes in himself. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. It's like it's it makes his you know his mum with that whole thing seem more sadistic that she'd allow her son to do this. Yet she blames everyone else for anything bad that happens to to Eddie. It's just odd as hell. And it continues. I mean, there's a little bit of bullying with the girls in Beverly, but it's a completely different moment from the movie here. They just kind of call her cock breath and a couple other things. Yeah, there's the hoe bag. Hoe and bag. She gives the best BJs. Yeah. And, yeah, <laughs> she's like, yeah, it's like girl one. It's obviously just got to be jealous. <laughs> you know? It's just, it's just the way, again, it's just the way it's written. It just makes me think she's jealous. <laughs> Beverly, yep. they say she gives all the best ones. So, well, if you're friends with her, she may teach you love, you know. <laughs> that, and so out, and outside the school, you have the you know, Dorsey's mother parading around with her sign. But only here, she's not, only here, the last name's different. It's it's Dorsey Cohen, because here they've made him the rabbi's kid, and Stan's not the rabbi's kid. No, yeah. They altered that slightly. Just, again, obviously, just to, it's, again, it's a random change, but it does kind of work. It works okay. Yeah, well, especially with, you know, the next the next bit with Stan, anyway. Because they do something a little bit different here. But, okay, and this is where we get introduced to the bullies, who have all been, almost all been renamed. For, for no reason, or yeah. possible typos. Yeah, Vic, Victor Chris is the same, but you get Travis Bowers, who is described as a tower of muscle, which... Yeah, a sadistic tower of muscle. Which is not really <laughs> how they cast it. No. that You would think, who's going to be this? If they, you know, using this description, who's going to play Bowers? Not the guy from uh, who was a bully for five minutes in the Dark Tower. Yeah, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> but no. Well, the, that that would have been interesting casting, yes. Yeah. <laughs> to continue with the, uh, with the name changes, you have... Uh, Patrick Hockstetler, which I'm convinced is a typo. It could be, although with all the random changes, it might not be. But it being a typo probably does make sense. Because in the um, in the second draft, this is an actual scan. They go back and forth between the two spellings. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because it's just one of the few revisions. Yeah, you go, they kept or something, and it's just like, yeah, do, do your job properly, guys, please. But the the best one or the worst one, depending on your point of view. <laughs> and it's just so totally baffling. Belch Huggins becomes Snatch Huggins. And the two of us are going to be saying Snatch in this episode way more than we probably should. Yeah, we're gonna be saying context. it more we're gonna be yeah, we're gonna be saying it more than Guy Ritchie. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> hey guys, remember when I make good movies? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um but no, and I've decided because this is just such a bizarre, notable thing, and it continues across both scripts. Anytime we have to say snatch, take a shot, starting now. Oh, God, it's going to be worse than the with nail and eye drinking game, I swear yeah. to God. Yeah, I believe this is the first screenplay archaeology drinking game, all because they named the character Snatch. Take a <laughs> shot. <laughs> Got you, guys. And okay, so that stuff all 
goes on, like, like the one thing that's a bit of a different detail because it wasn't introduced here yet is that Bauer's father is not at the school in this scene. No, he's not. It's literally, it's bar the rabbi's wife, Dorsey's mum, there are very few adults around. And, like, the police chief, there, there's cops there, I think, but, like, his father isn't specifically there. That came in in, in, um, in the Dauberman revision. And so you get the scene between Ben and Beverly at the side door, which is pretty much exactly the same, minus the, uh, some of the dialogue gets switched around, but, like, the, the new kids on the block stuff isn't in this script. No, yeah, there's very little in regards to that sort of stuff, which I'm, f- I'm glad they don't have the new kids on the block sort of stuff, <laughs> to be fair. That's a bit, <laughs> that's just random for a um, boy to have, but, you know. But, yeah, that's true. And, okay, could you explain to me what KIT means in this context? KIT? I'm not sure, actually. I mean, I don't think it's a Knight Rider reference. No. Would Knight Rider have still been? I don't think it would have been. No. 88, uh, 89, I think, um, I think Hasselhoff would have already moved on to Baywatch. Yeah, no, yeah, he would have been, or he'd have been at least in, like, the pre-production to move on. Unless it's a reference to, like, the whole password thing, you know, when Beverly says Kitty Hawk is a good password. That might be it. Now, see, I know way too much about Baywatch for someone who has never watched that show. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Obscura Slupa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, okay, so we get, um, um, Will goes home and we get a scene with, um, him and his parents being distant and we see that like interestingly the piano is covered in dust because his mother is just completely um shut off in this version yeah she she can't do anything at all that would make her happy because that would be bad to the memory of georgie in her mind is how it seems to come across and it, and the whole argument over the sewer map and the the, the model that will has made is that is not in this version yet. That comes in in a later draft. No, yeah, that's right. Um, it's just all stuff about piles of unopened mail and everything, and then the mum completely shutting him out by just sliding the piano room door shut in his face. And Okay, and then we get the scene at Eddie's house where we meet his mother and we see how overprotective she is. That's she's- pr- pretty much the same. Yeah, she's the. Was she an enormous three hundred pound woman in the film or the original miniseries? Not in the miniseries. She's just an old woman, but she is huge in the movie. I thought so. Yeah, so they kept that description quite well. Yes, and they do a uh, they do a clever thing in um, chapter two. Oh yeah, where his wife is played by the same actress. Oh, oh, I like that. That's a nice little hint. That's oh, I do like that actually. It's those little bits that always get me. You know, visually, it's a you know, I love those yep. like like little quick stunning visual sort of motifs that pop through. Yep, and from there it goes to the library, and you have some. There, there's no it encounter here like there is in the movie. He just kind of talks to Ben, just kind of talks to uh, the librarian, and then we get this weird scene with a one armed old man in an Indianapolis a USS Indianapolis hat asking where the children's section is, and I'm like. Okay, Quint, what are you doing here? <laughs> yeah. And you'd think, he's only missing an arm, yet he nearly got bitten in half in drawers, and you think, God, man, seriously. No, this, <laughs> this, this, is, this is Quint from the book who got dragged under on the harpoon. Ah, uh, okay. It only yanked his arm off. <laughs> only yanked his arm off, yeah. <laughs> now he's just, now, yeah. And now he's just, like, trying to recapture his childhood because he can't drive, fl- you know, drive boats anymore. Yeah, which I, um... I actually did have a a, a Quint related thing that connects to Pet Cemetery. I was going to mention, but I'll mention that when we're done recording. Uh, okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, so, sorry, folks at home, you're not going to get this that bit of goodness. No, it 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 it, it, would, it would be more appropriate when I to to talk about when recording a Pet Cemetery episode. That's true. Cause, yeah, because <laughs> it's actually it's not a joke. Oh, okay, then. <laughs> it's not a joke. It's more so a fact. Right? Yeah. And, uh, and so, okay, we go to uh, Beverly's apartment where she she's like digging through the fridge. It's all nasty. And she actually has a mother in this. Which threw me when I first read it. It was just like, yeah, because there's no mum in the films. Yeah, there's she's not in chapter one, which is weird because I was wondering, did they just cut her scenes out or something? And then you get to chapter two and it's established that she's been dead. Yeah. it. It is quite, yeah, especially when you know the film, the first film at least, and even 
Was there a mum in the miniseries eat as well? You'd never see her. I mean, Beverly is cooking her father breakfast. That's right, yeah. So it's just more like, so that hints that the mum's not around at least, or... No, before, before yeah, yeah, that, that part, yeah, so she's at least not around in that version, but she is in it, the book. I thought, so. again, I, I should need an excuse to go back and read the book, but I think now at least I do. But yeah, we meet her mother, and this is yet another... Okay, I'm gonna ha- I usually, I remember when we did the Kajanic script, I put a complete gag on, we're not going to talk about that scene, because that's all anybody ever seems to talk about regarding the book anymore. Yeah. The, the infamous Beverly getting a train run on her in the sewers. <laughs> Jesus Christ, yeah. I have to bring it up here, because it feels like Fukunaga, he knew he wouldn't be able to do that, so he wanted to fit in as much crass sexual material as he could, and it just gets worse in the next script. Yeah, it's, he wanted to, it's like he wanted to put in as many, like, yeah, minute references to that, at least. Yeah, certain things, like, you know, renaming Belch Snatch, take a shot. Take a shot, yeah. Yeah, but even no. yeah, Snatch, he, he even belches in this. He it even specifies in the script earlier that he burps in Eddie's face. It's just yeah. like, why change the name then? Yeah, and you, uh, and you just said his name, so take a shot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. but, uh, but no, to get to the point, Mrs. Marsh starts talking to Beverly about her, her about how she's going to be having her monthly soon. And she says, hey, you're going to need to go to the pharmacy and buy some of these. And, okay, I'm going to read this. Yeah. The way it's described, it's like it's shoved directly into the camera. Mrs. Marsh holds up a bloody tampon from a string. It's like you expect this version of it to be done in 3D. And yeah. she's just going to throw it at the screen. And you're going to have a bunch of guys and girls watching it going, Aah! Aah! Like uh, Paz de Huerta supposedly did on the set of uh, Boardwalk Empire. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I hadn't heard that, but yeah, oh, that's still... Uh. Yeah, she just... They told her there was a... Vis- apparently it was visibly hanging out of her during a nude scene, so they asked her, hey, could you uh, do something about that? And she just, like, pulled it out, threw it on the floor. Oh! Oh! Ugh. Okay, so we go to the synagogue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, moving on. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't top that. No. <laughs> well, Fukunaga tops it in a couple places in the later script, but... <laughs> Damn you, Fukunaga. But uh, we go to the synagogue, and Stan is practicing with Rabbi Cohen for his bar mitzvah, and they're talking, and apparently Stan's not doing quite as well as he could, and so the rabbi, because it's his son who has disappeared, he starts getting emotional and a little bit clingy, talking about how his own son, God bless him, may never have his own bar mitzvah, and it's kind of sad but kind of creepy at the same time. Yeah, it it hints it's like yeah, the way that it's like the rabbi is seeing Stanley as just a son standing and all this, so he like holds him close and he's starting to tear up. And all Stanley wants to do is get away and pee. Yeah, he has to go to the bathroom and so he goes down into the basement and he's looking for it and he can't find it, and so he, he find but he finds the mikvah, which is described as a cleansing room for the women of a synagogue during their monthlies, so thematic connection. It's possible, actually. That actually, yeah, that probably does link through from the Beverly stuff. And so, um, you know, he he walks in and he unzips and just starts peeing in it. So, yeah, um, classy there, Fukunaga. <laughs> yeah, Carrie. <laughs> yeah, one way to constantly just kick Stanley, you know, especially all the stuff the character goes through in multiple versions and in the final stra- and in the final book. Yeah, well, that's still um. That's still more dignified than what he does to him in uh, the next script. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Oh, man. Him not even being in the Kajanic script was was more dignified than what we're going to be getting to later in this episode. (laughs) Poor bastard. (laughs) But, but, no, he's there, and he pees in, and he looks down, and a naked woman starts to emerge from the mikvah. And she's standing there, you know, she's, she's, like, cut off at the waist. Like, I mean, she, she, her waist is above the water, and she's talking to him, and she's basically coming on to him, and her, her, and she says, she has a line where, like, her hand starts going down under the water, like she's going to be masturbating, and she says, has a line where she says, you know, I'll show you mine if you show me yours. And she lifts up even further from out of the water, and from the waist down, she just gets more and more rot. And yeah. Her, her legs have been reduced to bone and gristle, as it says. And her back is full of sores and bleeding. It's all shredded and uh, uh. It's very, um, it's very, um, The Shining movie. 
Yes. It's, and it would be a very creepy, unnerving visual. Of course. And she actually lunges at him and tries to get him. Uh, yeah, that's right. And um, he just, yeah, but she doesn't get him as he just legs it out of the synagogue. He's just, <laughs> he's like Roadrunner in this. He's just gone. And I think it's a um, a better scene than uh, the whatever the flute woman is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Also, and it, he just run past the rabbi and Dorsey's mother, and they're like, what the hell's he doing? And they shrug and tidy up, and you think, seriously? Your kid's gone missing. This kid's running out of your place screaming, and you're going to act like, eh. <laughs> you know. But then Why again, is I... that kid's pants unzipped? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. God. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have a word with his mother. <laughs> Yeah, but then we get back to the library. Ben's reading through Dairy History, and he gets a postcard. You know, he writes the uh, the poem on it. He goes, mails it, and after right after that happens, he gets um, grabbed by Travis, Hock, Stetler, Victor, and Snatch. Take a shot. Take a shot. Only take one. Don't take it based on the usage of the word, not based on how many times we say it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're we're not gonna be yeah we're not gonna be that you know we're not gonna be dicks about that. Don't worry, folks. Yeah, we're not we're not trying to kill you. <laughs> no, not not an, an you know if it's if this was with Nail and I, we probably would be with the amount of drink and it goes on in that. And so you know, they grab him and they push him up against the railing of the bridge, and this is where uh, Travis you know goes and cuts the tea into his stomach, saying, "I'm going to cut m- my whole name into him." And you know a car starts to pass. There's an old couple behind the wheel, and they see him, and they just keep driving, and Ben sees a clown riding in the backseat, grinning at him. He sees Pennywise. Now, this changed, of course, in the movie to a balloon in the backseat of the car, and Hockstetter sees it. Yeah, but I do prefer that, that, you know, at least Ben does see something here, and it's, again, it's going to become my sodding catchphrase for this podcast, but it's a great visual of just a clown popping up in the backseat, staring intently at him. Yeah, like I was saying before we got rudely interrupted there, as that Pennywise's face being in the back of the car was reminding me of that bit from Jacob's Ladder where Tim Robbins almost gets run over and he sees the creepy face looking out from the back. Yeah. Oh, exactly. That film, well, that film's full of creepy faces looking at, looking out at you through windows, so. But specifically the car scene. Yeah. Oh, no, I know what you meant. Yeah. And in this script, this is Ben's entire encounter with it is just seeing the face in the back of the car. Which is it's really lackluster. It's just like, oh, is that it? Yep, and oh, it's better than what the next draft does, but uh, moving on. Moving on, yeah. Where the fuck am I in my notes? Okay, there we are. Yeah, Travis and his gang pursue Ben into the woods, but they get distracted when Travis loses his father's knife, which comes back in the movie. Yeah. And so meanwhile, you got Bell, Bill, Eddie, and Richie. Stan's not with them in this version. They find Dorsey's shoe in the sewer pipe, and they meet Ben as he stumbles out of the woods. And they ride their bikes into town to help Ben, and they pass Mike riding on his bike as he delivers meat for his father. Yeah, and it's a whole thing where Richie's calling him homeschooled, and he get, then Mike calls him townie, which seems to be a running thing in this version. Yep, and so... Travis and his guys, are, this is where it gets different. They're um, they're in the Barrens trying to find a knife, and they can't find it. And he sees, you know, Mike go riding by on the bike. And so he says, oh, that N-word stole it. And so they go chasing him. And this is where we get the Kitchener Iron Works, where there's this whole thing in the books about how there was this explosion there, and all these kids died during an Easter egg hunt on Easter Sunday, and they reference it a bit in the movie. Yeah. But here, the reference is that they go there, Mike's hiding from them there, and there's a plaque recounting the tragedy that was put there by the Historical Society, and so he's hiding, and he manages to sneak away and ride off on his bike. Uh, But not before Pennywise appears behind him looking over his shoulder, and then vanishes again. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, Pennywise just lurking in the background of the scenes in this. Yeah, keeping them very more sort of like creepy background thing rather than how Skarsgård did it in the film. More or in in way different from uh, Tim Curry as well. Oh, yeah, everything's different from Curry. So. He, he's very um, he's very almost Michael Michael Myers ish, like original Michael Myers. That's right, just like the face appearing in the shadows sort of thing. 
And so he gets away, and then Hockstetler notices a lone balloon, and so the others leave, and he's like, no, I'm going to stay here. And um, one, he wants to explore the area, and so he goes into the basement of the ironworks, and he's still like the pyromaniac here with the can of hairspray, and so he's like lighting his way through there, and it's like lighting it up, and he gets glimpses of uh, Pennywise and the dead kids. And, the way it's and just... black monoliths as well, which I thought was a nice description. Oh, black monoliths? Oh, so, so we're in the 2001 universe. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't surprise me. It's well, it's a it's a very big macroverse, so yep, wouldn't be surprising. And so it's a pretty well described suspenseful scene, and I think it works a little bit better than the scene in the pipe does in the movie. It does. I preferred this version to what was actually in the film because what was in the film is um is what's in the uh the 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 Dalbermans revision. And so basically, what they did was that because. The movie kind of, they go away from the revision we're going to talk about, and they kind of work from this script, it feels like. Yeah, oh, and, definitely. And so basically what they did is that they cut back, you know, the Mike scene, and just instead of having him go running after a completely different kid, they just folded into them looking for Ben. Yeah, they did, yeah, they did just a lot of condense, condensure. Which, which makes sense. <laughs> no, Condensation. It's not a word. <laughs> yeah. Is that a word? It is now. Condensing. Yeah, that, that God. And then <laughs> the clown like jumps him. And there's a line there. There's a line Pox Stetler has in this scene, which is just another ugh, thing where he's like, "It's like I've seen your ghosts before. I've done them in their buttholes." <laughs> Yeah. And did they float? Which I thought was a nice little response. Yeah, and all I can think of with that line and all the weird crass stuff in this is it's like Fukunaga knew he was not going to be able to put you know the the infamous running a train scene from the book. Yeah. Here. So he's like, I'm going to put as much crude sexual material in here as I possibly can. Oh, definitely. It's like fitting something there in the background, or at least like one off lines and all that, and tiny descriptions. Yeah. And so the kids, you know, we get the pharmacy scene where Beverly helps them steal the medical supplies for Ben. Although here, instead, the weird, creepy, pervy stuff with the pharmacist, they just do, uh, they have, uh, you know, Eddie, st- you know, stage a fake allergic reaction. And then get stabbed in the leg by Dr. Keene with the EpiPen. Yep, that freaking EpiPen. What do you think about changing it from an inhaler to an EpiPen? Well, considering it's part of the whole sort of like allergy placebo thing, I think it's actually, I don't know, a bit more viscerally violent than it needs to be. Yeah, and it's not like an update thing because kids still have inhalers now. Well, yeah, exactly. And... To me, it didn't make sense. The fact that, yeah, it's just it just seemed a weird alteration. Maybe it's like you know, part of Fukunawa's you know, thing penetration thing that he's not having because he's not doing that scene. And so they run in the stand outside, and then Beverly goes her own way, and the boys, you know, they take the shoe to the police, who do nothing about it, and they they basically just kind of shoo him out of the police station. Yeah, thank you for being good citizens. Now, can you let us do our jobs properly? Yep, and they all go home, and Will, you know, has some more tension with his parents. They're talking about, like, their usual summer park trip. And they're like, oh, it was Georgie's favorite. And then they walk away, and he goes, yeah, it was mine, too. And so we cut back to uh, Beverly's apartment, and we get the scene where she's in the bathroom. And the way it's set up in these drafts is that she's peeing, and she goes to find some toilet paper to wipe herself off, but she can't find any. And I'm like, oh. Yeah, that, w- that was a little bit weird. That's... You'd think with two women in the flat, you'd have plenty, but, you know. Yeah, and so and this is when, you know, the blood comes out of the sink, which is described as, like, a demonic ejaculation. <laughs> God's sakes. Stop it, Carrie. Stop it, please. God. And so that scene basically happens the same, except it doesn't cover the whole room to the point where it looks like they ran out of fake blood and just put a filter over the scene like it does in the movie. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, like, um, like a deleted scene from Saw. And we get her father. Her father here is, you know, like, it looks like he's going to be physically abusive because he shoves her into the wall. And you get the scene where he's being creepy and kind of, like, smelling her and stuff, touching her face. Yeah. Which is pretty much the same. There's a whole thing's like, oh, it's the spider that scared me. It's the spider. Which would be Which I thought was a nice little reference. Yeah, I thought that was a nice little foreshadowing reference. And so then we have um, the, the scene in the basement where Will finds... um. Georgie in the basement, who's being controlled like a meat puppet by Pennywise. Wait, that, that that visual is just creepy as hell. And it's like he's attached and, to his back. Yeah, but it, it does specify later on, near the end of that little bit that 
It's like Georgie's just attached to his back as Pennywise is going through the water. And so that goes pretty much the same way, except there's a bit of an expansion on it where his father, you know, doesn't see the water in the basement, even though he's standing right in it. Yeah, and it's all, did you have a bad dream? He's actually a lot more receptive to Will slash Bill in these scripts than he seems to be in the the final film. Well, it's because they cut a lot of that stuff out. True. But it's like those scenes kind I felt it kind of worked a lot in this script. And so Beverly's mother also doesn't notice the blood in the bathroom the next morning. And the boys head down to the Barrens, and we find that the police has recorded it off for their search. And Travis, you know, he's reported Hock Stetler missing to his father, who's a cop in this version like he is in the movie. And he says, oh, he was last seen, you know, looking for Mike. And so this leads to Officer Bowers going to the abattoir to bring Mike in for questioning. And he strong arms his father so hard he has a heart attack. Yeah, after pretty much physically assaulting Mike to get him in the car yeah what's what's weird about it is that it seems like he has a heart attack but then in the hospital scenes he has cancer so are we saying that he beat the cancer into it i was again i was wondering about that but maybe this it could have been better informed earlier in the script maybe the dad had cancer but the salt brought on the heart attack and ben is explaining you know the history of dairy to the other boys and he mentions you know the well house was located when when the uh when you know the original settlers went missing he says the well house was located at the drain where georgie was killed and so they head to the quarry where it's basically the same scene only pennywise is looking under the water and tugging at their feet and... yeah which i thought was a nice little creepy little bit hold on why doesn't he take one of them there i don't know but again, you did kind of expect that, the way it was written, but then it was just like, I don't know. It was very Jaws. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true, actually. And so yeah, we get Will opening up about his encounter, and that gets Ben and Stan to speak up, and that's when Beverly takes them to her place to show them the blood, and they, they clean it up while Stan and Ben stand on lookout for her father. And I actually liked what the movie did better, where they basically make Richie stand lookout because they're tired of his bullshit. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was quite a nice, funny little... Moments like, can you stop with the comments? Piss off <laughs> while we do, <laughs> while we help her out. And so we get Mike leaving the police station after giving his statement, which you know gets Travis in trouble with his father. The uh, the other kids come in. They attempt to tell the chief about the thing that's stalking them, but the cops don't believe them, thinking it's just one of Richie's pranks. And that's when it jumps ahead to July fourth. And you know Travis and company they're destroying mailboxes with fireworks. And Mike visits his father in the hospital, who has bone cancer, I think they say. Yeah, so, some type. I can't actually specify. Well, they say, oh, it's in his bones, I think, but they don't say specifically yeah. it's bone cancer if it metastasized to his bones. Hmm, that's true. But, you know, while that's going on, Mike visits his father in the hospital, and, you know, he tells he tells Mike about how he witnessed the burning of the Black Spot Club in 1960 by the, the main Legion of Decency. And he, him and his friend went there and they jumped out the windows into the, uh, into the canal to get away from the fire. And, and there's a few other people in the canal swimming and they see Pennywise emerging from the canal to prey on the survivors. I loved how this is described, how the, the balloon comes out of the water and he's just riding it up and it's watched. He's not like, Pennywise doing his, like his magical stuff in the basement bit. It's like it's what is like m mode of transportation, as it were. Yeah, and now they don't give him a last name, but they do say that uh, Handlin's friend is named Dick here, and in the book it is confirmed to be Dick Halloran from The Shining. Yeah, that's true. I remember that. I thought that was a nice little reference. And so Mike leaves the room while his father is, you know, he's, he's, he's undergoing chemotherapy and then he sees like, it's like the fire alarm, the flashing light is going off, but there's no noise. And that draws him into the coroner's office. And like in between the flashes of the light, we get glimpses of Pennywise lurking. Again. Yeah. Doing it, you know, it's, it's essentially it directed by John Carpenter. And the encounter, he has the encounter of it in the form of a hawk mutilated corpse, which emerges from one of the morgue drawers. That's, uh, and that's just a creepy visual in itself. And he is, manages to escape the hospital just in time. And the way the flashing lights are described, I don't know if you saw uh, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark yet or not. Yes, I've seen that. I, oh, yeah. The the red, way to do the red room? The red room stuff, yes. Actually, that... I didn't think of that reading when I read it. And Oh, yeah, that I can see that now, actually. 
And so we go to um, the kids who are on Ben's roof and they're getting ready to shoot fireworks. And they're talking about it and what they're going to do. And they see the Bowers gang chasing Mike, who are in their they're, they're in their car. Yeah, the Trans Am. Oh, it always seems specified, the Trans Am. Yeah, it, it specifically snatches Trans Am. Yeah. <laughs> Take a shot. <laughs> and so they save Mike by uh, shooting their fireworks at the Trans Am. And then, because the, the chase eventually comes along to um, Kneebolt Street, which in this version is, it dead ends on a pier on the canal with what's called a lock house on the end of the pier. Yeah, I did like, uh, before we go on to this, but I want to go back to the, what, you know, was essentially the firefight. And because I loved how this was described. And I felt this would have been a really great thing in the film. You know, I could really picture it, especially Beverly with the six shooter mortar firework cannon thing that yeah. knocks her on her ass every time she fires it. Yeah, because the, uh, that's one minor problem with the movie is that the rock fight is not as apocalyptic as it's described in the book. No, it's it, not. Well, this brings about that sort of thing, and it's really great. And it's not. I think it's better on screen to get Mike as one of the losers than the rock fight is in the film. Because, I mean, it, it wasn't as great in the miniseries either, because, I mean, it's got the weird things like Ben discovering his slow motion powers and. <laughs> yeah, God, yeah. But no, I do like the fireworks fight. That's actually pretty well described. And they do throw some rocks at the end. Yeah, at the end, just as they're making their final retreat. And they're forced to flee into the house via a basement window, and the the board like falls off by itself, and it mysteriously replaces itself when Travis tries to find a way in. Now, okay, I have a question. This okay, house, yeah. This house is on the end of a pier, and they say specifically it's on stilts. How the fuck does it have a basement? No, I, oh, bloody hell. <laughs> I didn't even think of that. That completely passed me by. Oh, my God, yeah. Unless there's like a, a you know, secondary floor and there's another set of stilts. I don't know. Yeah, but yeah, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. No, it doesn't actually. Yeah, thinking on it, it really doesn't. <laughs> and so Eddie freaks out and he says, oh, this is where I've seen it. This is where I had my encounter with it, but he doesn't say what it was. No. So yeah, Eddie's counter and Richie's encounters remain completely off screen. Richie's doesn't even get mentioned. No, that's yeah, and that was quite. A, those are quite odd cuts. You think those would be important in regards to when they're telling the stories of how they saw it? Now, in yeah, you know, in the movie, Richie doesn't get an encounter either. Chapter two kind of uh, fixes that by putting a flashback scene in. Uh, so it's it's one of the cut scenes from the first one that they no, put it, in. It was something they shot for 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 chapter two. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they they went back and fixed their own mistake. That's nice of them. And so they head upstairs, and one of them peeks their heads out the you know the door into the first floor, and the door opens, and they go, "Okay, coast is clear." And they go back, and they close the door, and it shows Pennywise is behind the door, off in the distance watching. And then when they come back up, he's gone. Yeah, I thought that was a nice little visual as well. Although it's different from the way I tend to think of Pennywise. Like, I don't tend to think of him as a watcher. <laughs> no, but I, I suppose it works kind of well in this script as he's watching. It's that slow build of fear rather than the instant hit. It, it, it's trying to build suspense, and I think that works for a movie. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And so they see a group of crows in the house on the stairs, a murder of crows, I guess you'd call it. And they go, oh, there must be an open window somewhere on the second floor. So they head up there and they find it. Beverly and Richie make it outside. But then the floor collapses under Eddie, kind of like in the movie. Yeah, which falls, falls, breaks his arm. Falls into the kitchen and breaks his arm. And then the way out into the hallway gets blocked by the crows. So Bill, Stan, and Mike are looking for a way down. Well, Beverly and Richie do the same and they fall onto a big pile of rope outside. And then we get the scene of Pennywise emerging from the fridge, which is more or less the same from the movie. Yeah, yeah, pretty much the way it's described, definitely, that how his joints, his joints are, dis, you know, all over the place and he's moving like a spider. And he's like, he's like, re he's like, like putting them back in place. Yeah. And so he pulls out an old mat. So Mike is upstairs. He pulls out an old mattress to use as a cushion for their jump down, but he finds a child's corpse underneath it and he freaks out backs into the other two and they fall through the hole and they land on top of Pennywise who breaks their fall. <laughs> Sorry. That, that was blackly. Co I read that as like very blackly comic. Yeah. But at the same time, you're kind of taking away from your, your, your monsters 
intimidation factor when you do that. Yeah, that is true, yeah. And so they're saved at the last minute by Beverly, who shoots Pennywise in the eye with a bottle rocket. Yeah, is it meant to be the last one she's got, or...? I think so. Yeah. You know, after she used up that mortar she probably bought from that guy from The Simpsons. <laughs> yeah. And he, <laughs> he transforms <laughs> into orange gas and flees back into the fridge. Weird. That which seemed quite weird to me. You'd thought he'd scuttle back in like a spider. You keep that backwards and forwards rather than this weird change that he suddenly got. But I guess they're trying to uh, imply the, you know more of the, the cosmic stuff there. True. It just, it just seemed a bit out of place for this scene. And so they take Eddie home and we get his mother driving them away. And they catch a news report on the TV that says the police have caught the killer who's the one-armed man from earlier. So sorry, Quint. He, he has no luck at all. Yeah, I don't really think that was worth the setup of the weird one-armed guy in the library just to go, oh, we found the killer. Yeah, it, it was just like they'd forgotten or they'd remembered that they had this character. So it's like, oh, we could use him to, you know, save ourselves in this little plot line. Yeah. The police so, have actually done their job. And Eddie's mother is the first to refer to the group of kids as losers. So, and you think it's a bit late in the film for them to be referred to as losers? Yeah, and in the next script, they don't even call them that at all. No, they they do, don't they? Yeah, I but, think they uh, do. Wait, they do, but I think it's like right at the last minute. Yeah, the, but I think Eddie's mum refers to him as losers. Well, he she refers to Will as a loser for a specific reason in the next draft. Oh yeah, that's right. But it's not. It's still weird the way it's handled. So then we get August, complete with a title card, but then it's revealed to be August of 1879, and Derry is still a logging town. And then we get a scene from the book of Lumberjack Claude Haru massacring this, these men playing a card game in the Silver Dollar Saloon, and the patrons ignore it all, and Pennywise is playing the piano. Like a virtuoso, so it's Liberace playing for a bunch of, you know, loggers. Very strange scene. I liked seeing it, because it's like, oh, that's from the book, but it doesn't quite fit. No, not the way, again, not the way it's described in the script. It should have been more, They you get you don't have the August title card. It should have been, you cut to the scene, and then halfway through it, you cut back out, and Ben's reading them the book. Yeah, and especially the bit where, like, the last guy playing the car, card game runs away to the outhouse, and you see him get yanked down into it. Yeah. I don't, I don't think you needed that, really. <laughs> Like that that was just weird. Yeah. And so and so it cut goes back to August of nineteen eighty eight, where Ben is telling the story to the rest of the losers club, minus Eddie. And Will and Mike still want to fight back, but Richie and Stan aren't so sure. And so Will goes back to his house and in a scene which really should have been in the movie if they filmed it, where his parents oh, yeah. they're fighting over a box of Georgie's toys, and he finally confronts them about, you know, the, how distant they've been and he ends up storming out of the house. And he's staring into the drain where Georgie died, almost daring it to come out and get him, which you kind of get as an adult in Chapter 2. Oh, nice. But yeah, in the script, this was really intense and would have been a fantastic little scene on there, especially just like you could just imagine the pause between the two parents as they were, you know, as Will slash Bill is shouting at them. Yeah, and... uh yeah, that's cool. But then it leads into this kind of a weird moment because he hears the trickling of the water and he has like a eureka moment. And he starts biking around all these different locations to the Kneebolt Street house, to the ironworks, to to the, the fuck, what, what am I thinking of? To, to Beverly's apartment, which has this big tangle of pipes on the back of it. And he gets this eureka moment where he's like, like, it's connected to the water. It's like the ending of Cabin Fever. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah oh yeah exactly oh, think, yeah that's another one. Oh god that's, but yeah that's this seemed quite to me this seemed quite odd it was just like oh we've we've forgotten how they figure out where it is so let's write this random scene of oh i'm going to go back to all the locations we've seen it yeah it, it was a little weird and so while this is going on, Eddie gets visited by his doctor, who sees how his mother is treating him. And after a moment where it seems like he's creepy, he tells him that his EpiPen is a placebo. Yeah. And so, so I thought he, it was a n nice little bit. It's like so action, an adult showing kindness to one of the losers. Yeah. And so, yeah, but now we get a, a scene of, uh, we get the scene from the movie where Officer Bowers starts, you know, shooting at his son's feet. And you get the line about, all it takes is a little fear to make a paper man crumble. I love that line. And then Travis finding the knife with the balloon in his in his mailbox. And 
right after that, we go to Will talking to Mike, and they're in the uh, they're in the coroner's office again, and they're looking at the drain, and this is where. This is where you know, Will is explaining, oh, it must be down in the sewers because of the water connection. And he goes like, oh, crap, we're almost late for you know, Stan's bar mitzvah. So the two of them rush out. <laughs> and Beverly is preparing for the bar mitzvah at her place when her father confronts her about hanging around with boys. And he says he wants to check her for proof that, you know, she's still his little girl. And it's a little bit more explicit about it than the movie is. Yeah, oh, the way it's described in this script, that it, I felt really uncomfortable. Well, they, they did still make him pretty pervy in the movie, but... Yeah, but not as uncomfortable as it was in this script. Or in the book, because in the book, he's physically abusive more than anything. Yeah, which links more to why she picks that particular... You know, the boyfriend in the adult sequences in the miniseries or in the, and in the books. Yeah, he's more physically abusive than anything. Like it's implied he might be attracted to his own daughter, but it doesn't really come out until he's under its influence. Yeah. Whereas Fukunaga kind of takes it a little bit further. Yeah, he hints that it's always been in the back of her dad's mind, and he pushes it out way more, and it's just, it's skin-crawlingly creepy, but not in a good way. Yep, and so she ends up knocking him out unconscious with the top lid of the toilet and runs out of there. You know, we have Eddie standing up to his mother about the placebo, and uh, Beverly, you know, she runs into Will and Mike saying she thinks it was controlling her father, and while all of this is going on, there's like a huge storm brewing and breaking out in Derry. While everybody else is at Stan's bar mitzvah. Yep, and so we get Snatch, take a shot. <laughs> And Victor, they go looking for Travis in his house, only to find he stabbed his father to death, and Travis is in the living room, watching, you know, the Pennywise the Clown show on TV, which was something they really ran with in the movie in a good way. Oh yeah, I loved how they did it in the film, definitely. And if you look closely, any time an adult is shown watching TV, that's what's playing. Yeah, I spotted that. That yeah. was That is a nice little touch as well. It's a nice little subtle thread through the film. And Not Travis through the script, I mean. And in this, Travis is like, it's my gun now. Yeah, because he's left the knife in his dad's face. And so, um... Uh, oh, uh, quick question. Why in horror films, why do they always... If there's a cat, why is the cat always licking up corpses' blood? Seriously. Because people just hate cats for some reason. I don't understand it. Yeah, you could kill a cat in a horror movie, but if a, if a dog's in mild danger, they want to ban the film. Yeah. We can't, yeah, and, and with all the fucking morbid ass talking dog movies that are coming out lately, I mean, you need a you need a, like a remake of one of those where it's just, you know you follow the dog hunter around, and he's just gunning down all these Alec Baldwin talking dogs. <laughs> I'd go see that film. But yeah, they um the losers all meet up at the bar mitzvah party where they determine to enter the sewers and go after it, and so they go to Will's house and they gather all these odds and ends like a chainsaw, a bow, a can of hairspray, like basically stuff to use as weapons. I thought it, was, it just made me think of the eighties. It could have been like a Arnie montage. gathering his weapons montage. Like Commando. <laughs> Commando. I've got to link that in somehow, you know, as it's the odd one out. Yep, and so, um, yeah, and so, uh, you know, his dad starts banging on the door, asking to be let in, and they leave out the window. And so this is where they head to the ironworks cellar, and they point out a pipe where Will's like, that's the only entrance to Derry's old sewer system since it's been sealed off, so how is it moving around then? But whatever. It's an orange gas if it wants to be. And so, uh, you know, they get... They're attacked by Travis, who's shooting at them with his father's gun, and they run into the cellar, and Travis wants to pursue them, but Snatch take a shot, and Victor are reluctant because they're like, hey, Hockstetler disappeared here. And then Pennywise, he's be appearing between lightning flashes, and Travis stabs Snatch, take a shot to death. <laughs> Poor Snatch, take a yeah. shot. Yeah. And he intimidates Victor into going in with him, and so... um that's one thing I like about those characters in the book is that if they didn't have Bowers around, they probably would have been better people. Well, yeah, because they're quite, yeah, they are sort of like weak willed, I think is the right word. Yeah, they're the hangers on. Yeah, they're like, he, like, yeah, Bowers is the cool kid, so they've got to hang around with him. You know, as Edward Norton says in Fight Club, you know, what is it? Why does, why does a weak person have to attach themselves to a strong person? <laughs> yeah. And then Very true. Carter is like, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I love that. Okay, so they um, 
They flee into the sewers following Will's directions, and the tunnel they're supposed to follow dead ends at a stone wall, where they find Dorsey's other shoe, along with a message from Pennywise telling them to turn back. And so they kick down the stones, and they find what's called a black hole tunnel that gets narrower and narrower as they go. Travis and Victor pursue them. Okay, what was you going to say? I was just going to say, I, I like the visual, again, you know, I'm a visual guy, I like the visual, like a black hole tunnel that just gets smaller and smaller, and it's like darker and darker as they go. But yeah, this script, it starts the idea that they need to find a special entrance to the sewers, which I kind of just like the book's idea of them, that they just crawled down the pipe. Yeah, but that's, in the book, for a book like it, that's an oddly simple way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, in the film, they wanted to make it so much bigger, especially how they were splitting it. And so, um, where was I? Okay, yeah, so um, they, 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 they flee down there, and they're pursued by Travis and Victor, and they almost get Ben when he gets stuck in the corkscrew, as it's called. Like, it gets really narrow, but the rest of the losers pull him out in time, where they find themselves in a chamber with a thin membrane along the bottom, and they can see spiders crawling on the other side of it that react to wherever they put their hands and knees. And again, that's a nice visual. And it was a nice callback to the scary, you know, the, the spider in Apprentices that scared Beverly earlier. Yeah, and so they walk they walk slowly across it to keep it from breaking, and Travis, who in this is described as a mountain of, of teenage muscle, he can't fit <laughs> through the hole, but, you know, Victor is thin, so he can. So v- Travis just shoves him through, gives him the knife, and Victor at this point is actually going, like, he's gone crazy, I don't want anything to do with this guy. Help me, I'll, I'll, I'll come, let me come with you. He's pleading, and this could have been a great little bit on, on screen as well. Yeah, but then the knife punctures the membrane, and he gets swarmed and killed by all those spiders. Yeah, he falls through the membrane and devoured as he's screaming. And, of course, Travis is the other side of the hole hearing the screaming, and it's almost like he's getting off on it. He's like, yeah, I'm loving this. I can't see it myself, but I'm hearing it, and and I'm loving it. Yeah, and then the spiders start coming after him, and he screams and runs away. (laughs) Yeah, like like I would. You don't see any spider. I'm out out like a shot. (laughs) (laughs) And then the losers find themselves in a large cavern, you know, after wandering for a little while. And on the floor, there's what's called an oculus, which lo- leads to what looks like space in the floor. And all of the sewer water flows together into seven waterfalls that defy gravity and head up to a reflecting pool on the ceiling, which has an island in it. And that would be a great view. That was just, that's just a trippy sort of, that's something you'd see, um, what was it, Jodorowsky? You'd see him try and pull something like that off, or... um. I had another director in my head, but it's completely gone. So I'm I'm, I'm kind of thinking Lynch, but he wouldn't go all out for those sort of effects. He'd do that trippy. Yeah, Yodorowsky is the one I was thinking of, and there's another one. I I can't think of him either myself. I'm I'm thinking of Aronofsky from The Fountain. It's that thing with the tree on the, the in the bowl. Yeah, the the the, yeah the tree in the ball, and he goes up into the into the giant fucking cloud in space. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah. Yeah, but no, it's actually a cool visual. I like that they actually touch on the cosmic elements here. Yeah, and again, with like seven, it did make me think of like the the beams of the t- for the tower as well. Yeah, a little bit. But uh, so they um they 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 get in the water, and they it sweeps them up into the reflecting pool, and then gravity reverses, and they're floating around in the reflecting pool. And that reminded me of the the Power Rangers movie, the way they have to get into the command center. Yeah, I'll, yeah, that's true, yeah. Where it's like, they gotta dive into the water every single time. That's kind of a dick move, Zordon. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Zordon was always a little bit of a dick. Yep. <laughs> I mean, especially as played by Brian Cranston, but... <laughs> yeah. Uh... But okay, so, you know, they get up there, and they're, 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 they're swimming for the island in the middle, and they're attacked by It, who's just a vaguely glimpse below the surface in some kind of a starfish form. Who's like... Yeah, the... It- Describing like the orange, this orange eye under the surface. He's like he's like shooting tentacles, so it's like a mix of Starro from DC and Cthulhu, and and maybe that um, the deleted octopus scene from the Goonies. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, that's right. That's, a, a, dele- that's do. a deleted scene that they fucking reference in the movie itself. Yeah, and it's like, and I love the fact that pretty much the audience would have been the sheriff's response: octopus. <laughs> what? <laughs> Now, of course, there's no word as to whether this is actually its real form or not in this version. 
No, I don't think it is in this. I just think it's another form it's using to scare them, and it's just using its surroundings for this form. Yeah, and so Stan actually looks down into its big eye, and he basically he's looking into the deadlights, and so this is setting up for his, his turn in the sequel. Which I thought was a no, nicely done here than Which, actually in the film. Yeah, they they kind of screw that up. Because because they don't do that in the chapter one, they have to justify you know what happens with them in a different way in chapter two, and it's a yeah. But no, though they manage to drag him out of the water and onto the island, and they manage to snap him out of his uh, his little coma he's going into. Which is obviously what they changed to Beverly being taken by the dead lights in the final film. And so they bring him back to consciousness, and they approach the crypt, and they open a trap door on the top. And Will climbs into it first with a load of flares, and he's looking around, and he finds a fountain hole that connects to the pool on the bottom. And he finds Georgie's boat floating on the water. And then the trap door slams shut, and Will is trapped inside with Pennywise, who is crawling around like a spider. And he almost gets Will, but apparently the losers went, swam under the water, up through the fountain. Yeah, I thought that. It was just like, yeah, because you hear them banging... You're supposed to hear them banging on the trap door, then the banging stops. And they just start beating the shit out of the clown here. Oh, and yeah, they, they go to town on him in this script. I mean, it's... Bear, bear in mind, they're still wearing their formal wear from the bar mitzvah. <laughs> yeah. This is where posh... This is the posh people from The Purge just going nuts. Yeah, it, it, I, I'm not really sure I like how it's done here. No, I, I, I get what you mean, but to me, it's, I just think it's uh, a good visual, and it could... Could have been how they would have referenced the adults fighting it later on. You know, like they're dressed up in the formal wear. This is like, and stand just at his bar mitzvah where he becomes a man. So it's like a foreshadowing of how they fight Pennywise late in the what would have been yeah the sequel to this script. Yeah, and yeah, and uh, they. Uh... Holy crap! I think your headphones got pulled out. <laughs> oh no! Oh god! They back in. Well, I'm not hearing myself, so. Oh, oh God. Okay, but um, but yeah, but it's ba- basically what they do here is what they do in the movie, where they're just fighting back and not afraid anymore, and it's trying to take on multiple forms, which aren't actually specified here. No, they, which I they, think the director could have just gone to town on that one. So. Yeah, and they manage to subdue it, and it tries one last time to fool Will by turning into Georgie, but he weeds it out by doing the call and response thing, and he doesn't like how it sounds, and he goes, "Beverly hairspray," and then they burn it to death with the hairspray. Yeah, but I did like how when it first turned to Georgie, how it's described saying, we're all, you know, he's, it's like Georgie's going, we're all still in here. Even though you're killing it, you're hurting us. And I thought, oh, now that's a little, that's a twist of the knife. Now, the way they do that kind of attempt of tricking Bill in the movie, I really like, because it helps that the kid playing Georgie was a really good hack. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, he's fantastic in that. So when Bill has to put the fucking, uh, no country for old men thing to his head. <laughs> God, yeah. It's best to have you about um, yeah, impression. That, it, it's, it's really, it, it's a really almost tough to watch moment, but no. So they basically, they, they burn it and its body deflates like a balloon when, um, when, um, Richie goes to try and touch it and then gravity reverses itself again and the water and the crypt, it gets sucked towards the Oculus, you know, into the Mike Flanagan universe and, yeah. The losers almost get sucked in as well, but they get out of the water on time. And and it specifies that Ben is the one who saves Beverly from being sucked out into space. Yep. And I don't think she actually learns about the poem in this draft. Not in this draft, no. No. But she does, you know, mention it to Will, and Will's just like, huh? And she's just disappointed, and then it, then it's just forgotten and, about. At least it's better in the movie where she finds out about it and then forgets yeah, it goes with the effects of the town, so I thought that is a nice, that would be a nice touch. And so, um, and so they get lost in the sewers, and for a second there, you think it's going to go to the the running a train scene from the book. <laughs> but she um she gets them to focus by holding each of their faces. Oh yeah, and- uh, yeah. It take um, takes each of their faces in the palm of their hand, and the fact it's capitalized in the script. Yeah, Beverly takes. Bill's, Will's face in the palms of her hand, blah, blah, blah. And it's literally, for all all of them, it's like, oh, capitalized line, bold. This is what happens. 
Yep, and so they get washed out by the water onto the riverbank, and Will finds, you know, the glass Coke bottle, and he breaks, and he, you know, gets them to swear the blood oath to return to fight it again if it isn't truly dead. And we then see Travis back at his house, sitting in front of the static-filled TV with his hair turned gray or white, and the police arrive on scene and arrest him. And so Mike goes to the hospital only to find that his father has passed away because he apparently thought defeating it would get rid of the cancer. But sadly, Mike, that's not how that works. No, because I think there is a line earlier where it's like somebody says, I swear somebody says that it is eating him and that's why he's yeah. got it. So that's why he thinks doing it will save him. But it's like a little bit later. That's one thing I like about this this draft is that it gives Mike much more of a uh, an arc. Yeah, it, r- rather than him just being the token other guy in the film. Because in the, at least, although in the film he does get, like, some backstory and some reasoning behind his fear, because, yeah, in the next script, he gets nothing. (laughs) Oh, no, he doesn't. He's just there. Again, he is just, it's like he's just a token black guy. But then again, in the other script, somebody else isn't there. Yeah, but in this one, he, uh, he's almost like the emotional core of this draft, in a way. Yeah, that's true. And, it you know, in the fact, obviously, you could say that the fact he's not, part of the town itself so he's able in a sense in that what would be in the second the second part of this draft it explains why he would have stayed there a lot more yeah and he would have taken on ben's role of town historian yep and so you know from there on and will he's he heads over to his home and he hears his mother playing the piano because you know the piano was covered in dust as we saw earlier and this sort of clues him in that everything's going to be okay now yeah, because she's, play- she's playing one of like her favorite tunes, which always made her happy. Yeah, and then it cuts ahead to September, as Will and his family are leaving for the park trip. I mean, kind of late for that, but... You know. Yeah, because even earlier in the script, it specifies that it's the trip they make near the end of August. Yeah, and so I guess they're going for the weekend instead. Yeah, possibly, yeah. Labor, Labor Day weekend or something. That makes sense, actually, yeah. Yeah, and so the rest of the losers show up. They give him a camera as a gift. And as the family drives away, a single red balloon is shown floating in the sky above Derry, which pops right as the script ends. Yeah, that made me think, when the way it's described in this script, that made me think they're doing it as an end, you know, an end in case they can't do the see, you know, can't do the adult stuff. So they say, oh, the balloon has popped. That's because it's actually dead. But it's a nice, uh, but it's a nice, it's a nice subtle sequel hook. Yes. It's not, ooh, Freddy's still alive, you know. It's, yeah, it's not, cool, for, you know, from, I forgot, I've already forgotten the film. Sinister? Yes. Which also has James Ransom in it. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. But yeah, it's not but, the Bagul jump scare to say, oh, I'm still here. Woo-hoo. But now the, uh, oh, that, fuck, I forgot about that jump scare. That's the worst part of that movie. It is. But, uh, but no, I, um, of course, the balloon pop got moved to uh, the Hockstetter death in the movie. Yeah, and then and Pennywise jumps out from behind it. There was a version of this ending scene that's filmed that's in the deleted scenes on the Blu-ray. Only instead of the balloon floating in the sky, it just, the camera just sort of moves into the drain where Georgie was killed. Oh, that's interesting. So, okay, that's that script. Overall, not bad. No, I did enjoy a lot of the, the way the se- some sequences were written in this script. Especially, you know, as I've said to you <laughs> throughout throughout this, that the the Fourth of July firework battle, I would just have loved to have I, I, seen the, on screen. Yeah, the visuals are all very well thought out here, and you can you can tell with this draft that it is kind of an early draft because like a little things could use some shoring up, like the relationship between the kids doesn't quite spark the way it could. No, that's true. And it could but I do be... like how they wait until later to introduce Mike to them. Yeah, like they all they all know who he is, but they don't know know him. Yeah, he's he's homeschool. And that's all they know him as. Also, I do like how it, this is just a nitpick for me, honestly, but I do like how it very firmly all takes place over summer break. Unlike the miniseries where Eddie is like, this is the best summer ever. And then literally five seconds later, they're back in school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. That was just, that was a bit random. And so that draft is not bad. It could use some work. And next up is the undated revision, which is a scan without a title page. And it follows it a lot to a degree, but also has a fair number of differences between both it and the movie. Yeah, this seems like like a sort of say a tangent from the draft we've just read to the film. It like goes off in that little other direction before coming back to what we got as the film. 
And I think there's a very distinct reason for it, but uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. So jumping right into this, um, the differences, you know, between them, they start early. The time frame is now, you know, fall of 88 and summer of 89, like in the movie. Yeah. The uh, the creature POV in the cellar, it actually follows Georgie, but the cellar door slams in its face, which would have been a cool moment. Yeah, again, to me, that was very much, that's what I was thinking of with Evil Dead, not the first, not in first draft. That was very much Evil Dead yeah. to me. Join us. Enjoy this. Yeah. Swallow yourself. Swallow this. Could, could you imagine Ash Williams and Derry? Oh God, he pro- he'd probably be um, one of the one of the deputies. Just with his with his metal robot hand from Army of Darkness. <laughs> yeah, that's all you see in the background. You just hear the clanking as he's moving the fingers. And all right, and so um, the conversation with Pennywise is longer, and there's a bit in the conversation that made me laugh my ass off the first time I read this, where he says. Will wouldn't want to come. He doesn't like clowns. Then Pennywise just gets this look on his face like, oh. Like it, it was reminded me of Devil's Rejects. Yeah, oh yeah, I love that. It's that knowing look, understanding. What do you mean you don't like clowns? Don't we make you laugh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I do love that film. I can't wait for um, Free From Hell, actually. Uh, I- I'm iffy on that one, but... We'll just have to wait and see if a zombie yeah. can actually pull that out. But uh, but and also they added a little touch here where um where he also where where Pennywise is offering the bow but he's also offering his other hand to shake on it and Georgie is actually thinking oh I can reach in and just grab the boat from him real quick but then Pennywise gets him yeah and the description of what's going on with the old woman slightly different it's like she hears the scream and moves at a slow doddering pace to find out what's going on and also when Pennywise grabs Georgie he gra- it's, it says his um. It says like his hand now looks like a claw. Yeah. Which is real different because the what happens in the drain in the book is that you don't it says that his face Georgie sees it change, but you don't know how it changes. The sharp teeth was something that the miniseries brought in, and I think that's a good way to sort of sort of step out of its shadow in a sense. Yeah, ex- yeah, definitely. And also, you know, early on, you know, we get Richie gets introduced here as well, but now he's He's taken on some of Stan's attributes because now he's a Jewish kid named Richie Goldfarb. Yeah, that's oh yeah, because it's yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> and this is the thing. Oh, poor Stan, he he doesn't catch a break. He really doesn't catch a break. Stan gets cut out of this draft, and it's mentioned here that he's a. It, it says that he you know he carries around these magazines, and he's he's secretly more interested in the clothes than he is in the models. So it's inter- so it's so it's introducing the idea that he's somewhat an unsure, closeted, budding gay kid. Yeah, pretty much. Which came, which was in the Kajanic script too. It was actually, yeah, and which was another one where Stan was cut from the Losers Club. Although Stan was just cut. Period. There was no um. There was no attributes saved. No, that's true. yeah, that's actually very true. Yeah. And I will say this: this is a minor spoiler for Chapter Two, but they go there with Richie there too. Ah. In fact, they kind of bolted on with a flashback. I mean, I don't mind them doing it, but the way they did it was a little awkward. Oh, is it just one of those sort of, like, tacked on little bits? Well, the way they introduce it is in, like, the newly conceived of flashback to that summer, because what it's doing is that it, it's filling in that, that time gap during the montage where they weren't together. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so they introduce the idea there, and then it kind of comes to the fore at the end, and they, they, they do something really, really really emotionally impactful with it, which I liked, but it was just a little awkward the way they did it. Okay, then. Yeah, but um, but yeah, so they introduced that here. And also, this is where the idea of, of Georgie, you know, his body not being found and getting dragged off into the sewers by Pennywise, that's where this comes from. Yeah, because it does, it says in this draft as well that it's like Pennywise is actually like trying to, he's freshing around and trying to pull him in as if Georgie doesn't quite fit. Yeah, it does that in the first draft as well. Yeah, that's true. But it seemed more visceral a little bit here, especially with the old woman dothering to see what's happening. Yeah, and I understand why they did that, because it gives more of a dramatic through line for for what Will is actually doing, you know, taking them down into the barrens and stuff like that to try and find Georgie as opposed to just doing it. Like, I think it, I, I do think that even though it's one of those things where like, yeah, it's a change. It's not exactly necessary. I understand it makes sense. I actually don't mind it on the script level. No, no, I, yeah, I get what you mean completely there, yeah. But it uh, it jumps ahead to June from there and goes immediately to the school scenes and introduces a character in slightly different ways. And they show Ben, you know, who's shown not letting Travis Bowers look at his test answers here, which was talked about 
in the previous draft, but didn't actually, we didn't actually see it. And I want to know what fucking stupid teacher is holding a test on the last day of school. And clearly not do any, anything about a kid who's being held back, literally in front of the class, threatening to kill Ben if he doesn't give him his answers. Yep. And also the uh, the conversations that take place in the school are kind of split up between two. I mean, the dialogue is largely the same, but it's split up among the other kids. In, um, but it's split up into, between the classroom where they're talking as the clock is counting down. And uh, and they then move out to the uh, the Hanlon Burger joint because yeah, of this vision. But again, we are introduced to a couple of new minor characters who have a have a sort of funny scene later on. You know, the Greta and her two friends. Yeah, Greta and, and her two friends. They were in the last draft, but all they did was go, "Oh, hey, cock breath!" When they saw Beverly. Yeah, well, in this one, there's a lot more, little bit more to it. And the way it's described, one of the friends go and say, "Oh, I I hear she's given all the guys blowjobs," and. But the way it seems like it's written is if she's not angry, it's like she's jealous and wants lessons. Yeah. Yeah. It was just the way it seemed to be described then. I thought. And her, bully, her, her bullying is described as she smacks a field hockey ball at her. And yeah. And Beverly lifts up her leg and the response is, ah, we always knew you knew how to spread them. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 yeah. I mean, Fukunaga going with his creepiness again. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's it ramped up a little bit in this draft. But yeah, that you know the the rest of the of the conversation between the boys moves to uh, it moves to the Hanlon Burger joint because and Mike is essentially working as a waiter there. And due to this change in occupations, the Hanlon abattoir scenes and pretty much all of Mike's screen time and character development is just gone. Yeah, it, the the amount yeah the amount of stuff that's suddenly cut and all you lose in the difference between the two scripts is thirteen pages overall, but so much was cut and changed. Yeah, I feel like you could have gotten there. You could have gotten that cut. I mean, you didn't need every scene with Mike and his father. No, you could have. You could have. As much as I liked it, you could have cut the black spot flashback. Oh yeah, you could have got rid of that one. But yeah, kept the opening talk about sheep, and then kept the chat in the hospital, and yeah. that's more than enough characterization. And the, and the scene of his father dying. Yeah. But yeah, so that's weird. And the avatar actually gets moved over to the Bowers family here, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah. And so the encounter with the Bowers gang, Bowers is gang happens in the restaurant as well, but a lot of, it's not exactly the same dialogue. And Will has been carrying around a goldfish in a bag this whole time, which is named Stanley. Yay. And Travis throws it onto the grill and kills it. Oh my God, they've just burned up Stanley. And you think, yeah, wow, they really love that character, don't they? Yeah, they treat just... that character with so much respect. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's just tasteless, which makes me wonder, since Stan's not in this draft, who is slitting their wrists in the bath in part two, if that even happens? God knows. Um, I don't think anyone would. No. No, I think it would just be, yeah, I think they would have just cut that bit out completely from a second draft. But yeah. there's a sequel to this. And also, and, and Mike's dad has the line here. He has it in the other draft, too, where he says, and you wonder why I don't want you hanging around with these people. And I'm like, <laughs> because a fish landed on your griddle. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah. It, it, it's, it's like his dad's just like become, well, again, the whole Mike and his family have just become exceedingly as thrown away as Stanley the goldfish. Yes, and so um, Dorsey's mother is out. Um, she's out marching with her sign, like she is in the pre in the previous draft. She's outside the school, like she's in the movie, and here she's doing it out down the street by the restaurant. And they've been given you know their original surname of Corcoran back, and so he's not the rabbi son anymore. He's not he's not the lost Cohen brother. <laughs> no, yeah, you, you can't you can't have someone taking the spotlight from Joel and Ethan, can you? And so here we get the uh, the idea of. <coughs> Of um Will creating the uh, the sewer model from hamster tubes to uh, demonstrate you know how Georgie's body would have ended up in the Barrens you know that is in the movie and it's here and his yeah. father arguing with him over it is here too and and about the blueprints that he's taking without permission yeah that's here and then the synagogue scenes come next and this is where it gets fucking weird again <laughs> and uh, Richie is now oh oh I forgot to mention in the restaurant scene we also get to meet Snatch take a shot and Victor. Yeah, they're there, and it's just like, yeah, but Travis does all the work while um, Victor and Snatch take a shot. Um, they just, they just, they just follow him around like puppies. It seems like in this one. 
Yep. And so the, the synagogue scenes come next. And, you know, this is where we get the idea of the Jewish kid being the rabbi's son. And, you know, he goes to, a, you know, and, he, you know, he goes to, I go to the bathroom again and he still pees in the mikvah. Only here it starts overflowing and it forces him back into this office where it has, um, where it has taken the form of a handsome young clerk who has replaced the normal guy who's there, who's named yeah. as Mason. Who's out sick. And he just starts seriously coming on to Richie. He puts his hand on his hand, and he, then oh, Richie notices that it's pale white like a corpse, and that he has a clown's cuff coming out from under his sleeve. And the creepy line, I wear the underwear you like. And he also <sighs> says, he also says, Mason has told me what you really want as Richie runs away. Yeah. Oh, and he, oh, man. Just imagine Will Poulter doing that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, God. And so he's preying upon Richie's confusion about his own sexuality. And oh, yeah, because I, back in the burger joint, it's like he's carrying a magazine and he's got a art, men's underwear article or advert kept in yeah. amongst the pages. Yeah, it's been mentioned a couple times before now. Yeah. But, uh, he doesn't really seem all that interested in killing Richie. Like, he doesn't really seem to try. No. If it is, again, it's that, like, the one little callback to the previous draft. We read where it's like the ramping, slow ramping up of the fear. He, he wants, you know, this is like the starter, but when he's going to kill him is when it's the main cause, when he's ramped it up to God yeah, knows what I, level. I would have liked at least a little more action from him. Yeah. To do something. And also the line where he says, Mason told me what you really want. Does that imply something happened between Richie and the other clerk? Possibly. Or it's referencing that Eddie is attracted to Mason, maybe. Richie is attracted to Mason. Who did I say? I said, said, oh, God. He said Eddie again. But (laughs) but it's referencing that maybe he's attracted to him. But the thing is that they don't confirm it either way. So I'm wondering what really happened here. And that happens in a couple places in this script where something weird, creepy like that is brought up. And it's never confirmed either way. No. And and you wonder if they were going to save those reveals for chapter two. Maybe. Maybe. It's strange. Yeah. It is a little bit, yeah. Not as strange as me forgetting the names of the bloody characters. Okay, and then we get Eddie and his mother in the bingo hall. And so it's basically the same scene, except it's not at his house. And Richie meets up with Will and Eddie outside before they head to the Barrens. And Ben's library scene now has the uh, now has the librarian slamming the book on the table and doing that jump scare. <laughs> and him flipping pages. Only here, it's... He's seeing, like, the pictures in the book are defaced to make them look like clouds, and then there's a message directly addressed to him. What are you looking for? Or what are you fucking looking for? Something like that. Yeah. I can always scroll, 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 scroll. Scroll, scroll, scroll for a single, yeah, for a single line. That's... For a single line. I should have just written that down in my notes, but I yeah. was being, uh, I was being lazy. I don't, you um, know what, you know what I'm like, I, I, I'm, I'm odd. Nitpicky on a lot of these little bits. I pick out, I remember and focus on the odd little bits. Yeah. Not the character names, though. Somehow I can't even remember that. It it says, What are you looking for, Ben? Uh, What are you looking for? I don't know. I thought you swore. I actually really like what they replaced it with, though. I like, you know, the getting closer and closer to the severed head in the tree. Yeah. Not only because it's creepy, not only because it's creepy, but because it's from the book. Yes. That and that's the thing, the, head, the head being in the tree, yeah. Yeah, and that's something I've noticed that um, these two drafts don't take a lot from the books, especially in regards to what scares the kids. Because you know, like the werewolf stuff from the book, it was in the well, miniseries. I mean, they almost couldn't do that because of copyright reasons in some places. Mm, true, but I always I thought those to- were big parts of what scared them in the books, and it's like. They've ignored an awful lot. Well, 80s kids weren't going to be scared by uh, the creature from the Black Lagoon. No, that's true. Um, they, they'd be scared of um, Canon's latest film. I don't know. Oh, yeah, <laughs> the, the latest Chuck Norris movie. The latest Chuck Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, okay. not missing an action free. Yeah, the, the one-armed guy shows... Or is it Braddock missing an action free? It is. It is. That's the nitpicky <laughs> but, uh, thing I should have noticed. <laughs> yeah, the one armed guy shows up here as well, and I don't think he actually comes back in this. He doesn't. He just has the one little bit. He flicks a coin into a jar, takes a postcard, and that's it. He's gone. And also, um, I think 
this is where the reference there's this reference to the book the you know, the the history of dairy being you know hidden behind the radiator which i thought was kind of cool yeah and he asks he asks her why is it why is it there and she completely just changes the subject and okay we get to the encounter with ben's encounter with travis and the gang and this goes differently very differently and it's another one of those weird things that they do where instead of trying to carve his name into ben he Travis uses, you know, this what's called a Rambo knife here. So I'm just imagining a gigantic knife. He, yeah, he's trying yeah. to um, he's trying to um, prod him into jumping off the bridge because apparently snatch, take a shot. His mother, <laughs> the, the counts, the, the guidance counselor told his mother that they moved to Derry because in their previous home, Ben climbed up on his roof to try and commit suicide, but then back down. And now they're going, we're going to make you finish the job. Once again, this is something that. We never get any confirmation on one way or the other if it actually happened or not. No, and it's for something so far away, it's incredibly dark. But then again, it could have been Ben who takes Stanley's place in the start of part two. Maybe that is possible. That's the only thing I can think of. And then they just give Bill slash Will Ben's romantic storyline for part two instead. Which they honestly kind of just gave him in the book anyways. Yeah, true. That, that's one thing in the book I have never liked is is that whole thing where they just, where, where, where adult Bill and Beverly just fuck because it's like, dude, you've got a decent wife. Fuck off. <laughs> yeah, but then again, don't forget what um, Beverly remembers when she sleeps with <laughs> Bill in the book. Oh, yeah, yeah, she remembers. She remembers the train. The train, yeah. But, um, okay, so Ben does eventually jump, and he gets banged up, but he lives. And at the bottom, he meets this old guy who's a fly fisherman who scares off the bullies, and he's Bob Gray, who that name actually comes in this. Pennywise, in the book, always introduces himself as, I am Bob Gray, also known as Pennywise the Dancing Clown, which... Which is how he introduces himself to Georgie at the start of the script as well. Yeah, and adaptations never want to go with that for some reason. No, I think they... They were probably worried about humanizing Pennywise, making him less monstrous. And he's described as looking like Pennywise without makeup, so it's like Will Poulter in old in like age makeup. Yeah, it, well, yeah, they'd have to do like the old age, older age makeup to, for it to work. Yeah, but like, and what's weird is that like he he's he's talking to Ben, and he goes like, "So it's true what they said, Tom? Maybe you should just kill yourself." And I'm like, "Okay, you're you're Pennywise from the YouTube comments now." <laughs> yeah. And it's not clear exactly what happens here because, you know, Travis, Snatch, take a shot, and Victor and the Hockstetter, they come down. They they come down and suddenly, like, within, like, minutes, both of them have disappeared, and it's not clear what happened. Yeah, because um, Gray has taken Ben's hand, and they just they just vanish. And so because they've gone, it's like, oh, I've got to look for my knife now instead. Yeah, because... My dad know, brought it back from there. So, yeah, so this whole weird thing with, like, with, like, it turning into fucking the guy from On Golden Pond is not really... No, that's it, a random it, reference. Yeah, it, that's basically what it is, though, right? It, it is. It very much is. I mean, why... <laughs> <laughs> I like that, actually. That's pretty... It's just Henry Fonda. Just yeah. there. But, like, I mean, it, it just feels kind of like a, a pointless sort of let's give Ben an id encounter here. Well, yeah, it's like we've got to give him more than what we in the backseat of the car that was in the previous draft. And now the car still drives by, but it's just, you know, the couple in the car ignoring them. Yeah. But yeah, the idea that, you know, the Rambo knife came from Vietnam is interesting. Okay, it's, they're very much throwing more 80s references in this in this draft, I think. All right, and so we get the uh, the pharmacy scene, and, you know, it's, it's basically the movie now. We do the creepy thing with the pharmacist and the Lois Lane line. Although, actually, well, yeah, because we've... Go back just ever so slightly before the pharmacy scene because we have Bob Gray and Ben vanishing, and then the next time we see Ben, he's just running out of the woods, all bloodied and cut up, and all this. So you wonder if it was there's like a weird cut and paste job. Yeah, yeah, it's weird like that. Yeah, it just it just seemed again made that whole them disappearing out of place because you think you're disappearing. Oh, they've oh oh I actually thought we were going to get a shock and Ben was going to be killed off right there and then. Yeah, it's it's very odd. So, okay, we get the pharmacy scene, 
And then we get Ben, they go to Ben's house and, you know, they show his research into the history of dairy and they talk about the black spot fire, a mother who drowned her kids in the standpipe, which is a bit of a different version of something from the book. Yeah. And they make mention of the original colony disappearing and how it was situated near where Kneebolt Street now stands. Yeah, that's where the well is, the original town well is somewhere near in Kneebolt Street. And so they take Dorsey's shoe to the police chief who's hanging around in the burger joint. But it's clear that they're, they're not really going to do much. And so we get some, uh, it, you get some scenes intercut. The, the scenes with, um, Beverly and the blood in the sink and, um, Bill dealing with his distant parents, those are intercut with each other. Now, the blood in the sink happens in a different context here where her parents are hosting some kind of get together and one of her watching parents, a baseball match, I think. Yeah. And one of her, her, her father's friends, he just sits down on the couch with her and basically just starts making passes at her. So once again, Carrie. Yeah. And then when she gets up to leave, he smacks her ass and tells her to get him, get him a beer on the way back. Carrie. So that so th- the sink stuff still happens all the same. So there's more people there. Yeah. And um, Will has his basement encounter with Pennywise and the Georgie puppet, which is more or less the same. And then the next day, the kids get barred from the Barons again. And Ben's like, hey, let's go to the quarry. And then we get a scene of Travis here where we see him. He's putting ointment from where his father beat him. Yeah, on his back, he's rubbing the cream into it to um, cover it up. Which was filmed and cut from chapter one. But I think that would have worked a lot better because I felt like you only just kind of get a few references, I think, in chapter one to Bowers and, you know, how much his dad, how abusive his dad is. And it, it expands a little bit where he goes, he goes, before you go, get me a beer. He basically makes him serve him. Yeah. In the, in the deleted scene that's on the Blu-ray. So that really should have been in the movie. Yeah. That's the way to edit our own version. Well, I don't get why they cut some scenes, because they only would have made, altogether, they only would have made the movie like two minutes longer, but it's it's important stuff. Yeah. It's amazing how some good stuff and important stuff to make something more cohesive just falls through the cracks for some studios. Yep. And so, yeah, this is also where we learned that, you know, they're running the abattoir in this version. And so the kids, they bike past the kitchen nor, as it's called here, iron works on their way to the quarry, and we see the plaque. Here and then the quarry scene is almost exactly happens almost exactly the same. Only Bowers and the gang show up this time, and they're hurling insults at Beverly. And as the kids leave, Beverly tells them to fuck himself. And Hockstadter is like, "Ha ha ha!" She told you she's got balls. Is the line? And and Travis is like pissed off about it and like shoves him into the quarry. And they're like, "Dude, he can't swim." And this will be his chance to learn. Jesus Christ! And then Hockstadter he gets yanked under by Pennywise. So this is kind of um paying off that setup from the other draft yeah which i think would have worked so well yeah it works because this yeah the scene pretty much happens from the previous draft here it's just hockstetter stetler however this they've spelt it this time they spell it both ways in a couple places in this draft <laughs> yeah so i think that's a cut and paste job coming through i think but yeah also, him, him getting also, pulled down is a nice but yeah, yeah as you said but, it's a great but, but, payoff but, but, yeah, what I was saying is that it's also what ma- that's what makes me think that in the other draft it was a typo. Yeah, most likely. And so yeah. Travis, and I like this as a humanizing moment. He actually dives into the quarry to go get him, and he's 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 diving around underwater, and he's he's not seeing him. He's completely vanished, but he sees the deadlights, which, which we thought, we don't see. No, but I thought that was a nice little touch as well to pick up on later. And we see that it is manipulating him even now. Yeah. And he shoots up and's like, "We can't find. I can't find him. He's forgone." But I feel like that's a nice character one day. He's willing to dive in there after him. Yeah, it shows. It's like his friends are actually his friends. He just can't control his anger because of his dad. Yeah, and he gets and he's getting and he's getting you know pulled into you know its its machinations. Yes. And so this is where they go to her apartment and they clean up the blood, just like in the other draft. And just like in the other draft, they have to flee at the last minute as her father comes home. But instead, they go together and they talk to the police chief at the burger joint, telling him about it. And this is where, you know, Eddie says, I saw a hobo, but we never actually see him see that. No, <laughs> which I thought was a random rep. I did have to go back and see if I see if I m- missed that bit <laughs> when reading it. No, he definitely says it there. It's just we never get much. We just never actually see that encounter. No, that's what I mean. Because he said it, I had to go back and read it again just to see, did I miss the hobo bit? Which is a shame because I like the scene in the movie. I I like how, you know, it switches from the hobo to Pennywise. And Pennywise has the line where he says, hey, Eds, if you lived here, you'd be home by now. (laughs) 
which is creepy. <laughs> it is. It's a brilliant line. It's how it's delivered as well. And so, um, and so Mike follows them out. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Eddie's outside talking to Ben as he's standing watch at the apartment. He says, "I, I've seen it too." And then during the you know the the, the restaurant scene, he says, "He says I saw a hobo." And so Mike he hears what they say and he he follows them outside saying, "Hey, I've seen it too." And that's almost everything you get from that. Yep, that's completely brushed under the carpet. And it jumps ahead to the Fourth of July. And the kids, they arm themselves with fireworks to head out to the Niebold Street house, because that's where Eddie says he saw it. Yeah. And he really doesn't want to go in there, but Will is being really insistent about it. Like, he's almost, it's like he's like he's a little too obsessed at this point. Yeah, which I thought, I thought was actually, and what happened to you, I thought was a really cool little bit. Yeah, and so he tries to basically force, he basically, because um, Eddie points to the, uh, the space underneath the stairs, which is where it emerged from in the book. And he says, oh, it was under there. And he basically gets them to uh, to cl- climb in through the basement. And Eddie wants to stay outside. And they're going to draw matches because Beverly burns one. But then they all come up unburned. That's right, yeah. So they're getting... Ma- so so it is manipulating time and space itself to get them all into the house. Uh, again, which I think is a little bit a nice, a little bit referencing the macroverse and what it does to people. And so they go, they all crawl into the basement and they find the well when um, the floor collapses under Ben. And so Eddie's going to stay in the basement and Richie stays with him. And in, oh, oh wait, and they're still in the basement. Um, Will finds Georgie's boat in the furnace, which collapses into ashes when he touches it. Now, if that had been on screen, that would have been heartbreaking. You yeah. know, that would just so, be all. And so Will, Ben, Beverly, and Mike, they head upstairs. And we get the bit where the door opens and closes, but instead of Pennywise being in the distance, it's a balloon floating by. Which is a bit more subtle, but I did prefer the Pennywise in the distance from the previous draft. Yep, and so Richie and Eddie, they stay in the basement. They're eating snacks together. And so the kids upstairs, they check the parlor, and they see feet sticking out from behind the curtain, and they yank it open, and they find what I can only describe as Old Chief Woodenhead from Creepshow 2. That's how I thought of it as well. And Mike's just like, oh, that's what I saw at the Ironworks, and that's all you get about his encounter. I'm like, what the hell does this even mean to him as a character? <laughs> yeah, because he's not the history. He's not the history buff. You'd think that'd be more Ben having read up on the history of the town and what ha- possibly happened to the first settlers. I mean, you've got no, you got no reason to be afraid of Old Chief Woodenhead. You're not the guy from Mind Hunter and Red Face and the shitty wig. <laughs> no, with my long, glorious hair, which is gonna get me paid in late. <laughs> but of all the things to reference, of all the Stephen King things to reference, you reference Creepshow too. No, which I think, which I think actually came out in '89. I think. Yeah, or, it did. So I think that's probably the only reason why the reference is there. Because, I mean, 89, I mean, Creepshow 2 is just the most random, I mean, the only reason people remember Creepshow 2 is because of the raft. <laughs> yeah, which was great. And the fact which was that meant to have two more stories that got cut. Yeah, people, I mean, Old Chief Woodenhead is okay, the raft is good, and the hitchhiker, the only reason people remember the hitchhiker is because of Thanks for the Ride Lady. Yeah. But, you know, but okay, so yeah, that happens, and then... You know, they um they, they go looking around some more. Ben finds an armoire with it has names of the victims scribbled on the inside. They find like bits of children's clothes and um and they find there there's like there's like a scrapbook in there, so it's almost like this is it's like like his trophy room almost, which is interesting. Yeah, I was thinking that that which bemused me a little bit that it'd have a scrapbook. It's like it's Captain like, Picard. Yeah. <laughs> True. And because well, it- and because I didn't really want to write this this out in my notes, I, I did a page reference because they find a picture in there in the back of it, and it's called a framed 18th century etching depicting a couple praying before the gates of a country house to an orange moon, their backs to a front garden littered with the corpses of children being eaten by a rudimentary yet recognizable figure, not bodied as a clown, but in the form of a humanoid demon. So that's a nice, you know... I- it's a nice little visual that would to see something like that, and you know, say the camera would pan slowly across it till we get the humanoid Pennywise. Yeah. But I mean, one thing I like about these scripts that does um, it does give a bit of logic to why it likes this house. Yeah, it it's, it, it does center it a bit more. Because in the book, like I mean, this whole thing about it being the well house and on the site of the first colony, that's not from there. It just likes this house for some reason. See, it's that kind of stuff that makes me want to go, well. I should go back and reread it anyway, but it makes me want to more just to pick up on these little bits. 
And at least I don't remember. I, I don't remember it say. I what the fuck was I thinking? I don't remember it having a reason for liking that house. No. But these scripts actually give it a nice little. It's the center of its feeding ground, essentially. Yep, and so in the basement, it emerges from the well in the form of the hobo that Eddie saw before. The syphilitic hobo. Yeah, they don't actually say they don't actually say that in this draft. Don't they? I thought they did in this draft. Well, they don't describe what's wrong with it. They just say that it's like it's like wrecked by some kind of disease. Ah, uh, okay. I know, you just got syphilis. Oh, it does, oh, it does say syphilis here. It says Pennywise morphed into the form of the hobo ridden by syphilis, nose rotted, and lips bitten bloody. Yeah, nitpick to the rescue. <laughs> yeah, it's the um, it, it's the Dalberman draft which I skimmed through, where they um, where they specifically center in on it being an embodiment of disease. Ah, uh, okay. And so they try climbing up to the window again to escape, but Eddie gets snagged by the pant leg and falls, breaking his arm. And so, um, and so they're climbing, and um, Richie manages to, um, you know, you know, fend it off a bit by dumping coal from the coal chute on top of it, which I suppose is better than them falling through the roof on top of him. Yeah, that 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 works a bit better. And so they're climbing for the window, and upstairs, the other four they hear the commotion when they try to find the cellar door. The halls just keep twisting endlessly, and so they instead go and um, they tear the boards away from a window to get out. It's Kubrickian. See, this means that Pennywise faked the moon landing. <laughs> yeah. And he's managed by Puff Daddy. And so they help pull Eddie and Richie out of the basement. But, um, you know, it taunts Eddie about his mother, saying, sick people are my specialty. And then it taunts Richie, saying, don't touch the boys, Richie. They'll learn your secret. Which I thought was a nice little bit. Yeah, he's preying on their insecurities. Yeah, pretty much. But then Will gets it to uh, fall back by stabbing it in the eye with a fire poker. Which, uh, again, I didn't remember them having to hand before. I think they pick it up when they're in the parlor. Ah, uh, okay. It's probably one of the throwaway lines, and it, you know, it's just still there. Oh, yeah, he's still got the poker. Stab him in the face. Yeah, and so they, um, they, they get out of the house. This is when we cut to Travis Bowers and his gang, who are making out with some girls all together. Travis has got Greta. She's try He's basically having that scene from Animal House. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. yeah. Greg, is it supposed to be this soft? Or she's trying to jerk him off and nothing's happening, and he starts paying <laughs> more attention to, to Victor, I think. Yeah, that's right. Well, obviously, you know, he it, it, what they're with what they're implying here, he would not get turned on by snatch. Take a shot. Take a shot. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, because he's watch. He's more watching what Victor and the girl are doing. But yeah, it does seem he's focusing more on Victor. And then she starts. Um, he eventually just snaps and starts strangling her. And then they leave. And Greta's like, "Hey, your dick's the size of a tampon." Blah blah blah, and runs away. And I'm like, uh, "Wait a minute." Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't a think... tampon mean it fits perfectly? <laughs> I can't speak as an expert. Obviously. <laughs> no, we're just assuming here, especially then as she wiggles her little finger as the girls all walk away, getting the worst blue balls known to man. Yeah, and then he sees um, he sees the kids, you know, riding by on their bikes and gets pissed off. Goes, okay, let's drive after them. And so we get the fireworks fight happens here, only it's really short and kind of throwaway. Yeah, and that annoyed me. Yeah, and then it ends with a spontaneous kiss between Will and Beverly, and Ben gets jealous. And so they take Eddie to his house, his mother freaks out and drives him away. And they have their argument here, kind of like they have in the movie, and Richie doesn't want to keep fighting because he's afraid. And then Ben takes his side, and it's pretty much said here he does it because of his jealousy, and I'm like, oh god, do we need this CW bullshit in here? I guess I suppose they have to find, you know, find a way to split the group apart even more, don't they? I think it worked better in the movie where his guts were leaking. You know, as Richie says, this motherfucker's leaking hamburger helper. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, that that worked better for me. It's not this petty bullshit. No. Even and though so I, it, one thing I've ever mentioned, their ages change in the two drafts. I, I think they're that, 14, they're I think 14 that, in both. Are they? I thought they were. I thought they were older in this draft than they were in the previous one. Uh, the ages on the on the bullies change slightly. Ah, that's probably where I'm getting it from, and of course, that they makes sense around, with they, Bowers they being around. held back. Yeah, between all three drafts, they flip around between 15 and 16 and 17. Yeah, that's, pro that's probably where I'm getting it then. And so, you know, the the argument, it boils over because Richie says, you're not going to let you get us killed like you got your brother killed, and that's you know, what splits them apart, you know, for their romantic comedy third act breakup. Yeah, <laughs> yeah one hell of a harsh romantic comedy third act breakup. 
And so here is where we get the trans the um the transition to August. Only instead of the the silver dollar scene, we get a flashback to 1625, where I actually I actually marked this out in my um I actually marked the page here as well. Oh yeah. And because I, I like I had an idea of reading the whole thing out, but it's a little bit too long for that. Yeah. Go with what your gut says. If it's not leaking ham- hamburger meat, I think go for it. All right, let's go for it. I'll um. I'll do I'll do Pennywise. Uh, I'll I'll narrate and do Pennywise, and we'll fill in the voices, the rest of the voices as we go. Oh God, I'm gonna have to find the script now. <laughs> it's, page, it's at the bottom of page seventy-eight. I thought it was. Come on, there we go. Okay, we ready? Almost. Bloody computer's being slow. <laughs> but go for it, and I'll I'll be able to jump in the voices when I when I get it. Title card over the Penobscot River, August. Tilt down to the overhead shot of what we expect to be Derry 1989, but instead we see nothing. Just the intersection of a stream and river and the surrounding wilderness, towering black pines as far as the eye can see. Derry, just as the first settlers arrive. 1625. Exterior wilderness day, a line of white settlers with tall hats, black Puritan clothes, and deep-set eyes have seen a million hardships, forged through the dark woods. They are led by a similar line of about 40 Penobscot natives. In the middle of the river, they come to a stop, protective, concerned. The pilgrim leader steps forward. A French translator works with the native leader. They speak in hurried, hushed tones as the native leader describes the land in front of them in Penobscot Algonquin. Algonquian. Pilgrim leader, what's he saying? Translator, only broken land lies ahead. I was going to say, do you want me to do a French accent? No, well, if I was going to do a French accent, I'd have tapped my arnie. <laughs> um, uh, but what would he understand, have us understand, by broken? The translator conveys I'll, I'll the do pi- the narration, I'll do the oh, narration. Yeah, yeah go ahead. The on translator, then. I'll do the leader, and I'll just do whoever speaks first in the scene, unless it's, unless it, unless it's a scene with Pennywise. All right, go for it. <laughs> The translator conveys the pilgrim. Well, you, you, you've already done the translator, so you'll do the translator. The translator conveys the pilgrim's question to the native leader and receives his emphatic reply. He answers, bad medicine. They go with us no further. That is arable land. Whatever dispute you have with the natives of this place, we will explain to them is none of our fight. God bless our going forward. The pilgrim nods to his people and the settlers continue to forge ahead, passing through the line of natives. The native leader can't help but look with great fear at the cluster of little children traveling with their parents. A bird-like creature of human eyes watches them from the water. Time cut to exterior pilgrim village three years later, day. A small village has been built within a logged out clearing on the river bank. In the thick in a ugh, in a thick pine forest nearby, men chop down a tree where two kids play on logs floating in the water, one showing off for the other. Watch yourself, Avery. Sorry about that. <laughs> the kids, I was gonna do the same. <laughs> pardon to all the women in the audience. The kids laugh and josh, jumping the water between them and keeping their balance upon t- two two Misspelling buoyant logs. Unseen, a white hand darts out of the water, grabs Avery's leg, and pulls him under into the abyss. The pilgrim girl's face goes pale. Hearing the splash, the men look up, seeing only one child standing on the water's edge. Exterior, wellhouse, day. The pilgrim leader thatches a roof over a stone well in the center of the village, grabbing hay and filling it in. Through a gap, he can see a teenage girl with a baby on her back, filling a bucket. He grabs some hay, looks back, the bucket swinging wildly on the rope, the girl gone, only the baby left there on the lip of the well, crying. Hello, Sister Abigail? He hurries down the ladder, looking back toward the garden where she was taking the bucket to the others, and no sign of her either. Just as he jumps to the ground, the crying stops. He turns the corner through the door, only to discover the baby is gone. He looks to his feet, the ground of the well house squishy and wet. Exterior, Pilgrim Village Day, a wide shot of the village in a violent rainstorm. Axes swing and trees fall as the Pilgrim leader directs the building of a fortification around the village. Why didn't you do that when you got here? (laughs) It spikes aimed outward at the dark and forbidding forest. We crane up along a tree. The face of the Penobscot native with razor teeth, Reed Pennywise, appears out of the bark of the tree. We continue to crane past the gnarled head that is looking for its next meal. On top of the tree, a bird clings to a branch with human eyes. This thing loves human eyes. It does. <laughs> Exterior it, fortification, pilgrim village. Oh, finish what you're saying. Oh, no, I would say it really does, which you think is weird, obviously, is it probably hasn't come in contact with that many humans? Yeah, I suppose so. Exterior fortification, pilgrim village, night. A full, merciless moon shines on the isolated encampment. Pilgrims stand watch on the new fence, vigilant with muskets. The pilgrim leader directs a group of armed men off into the woods to recover their children. Interior cabin, bedroom, night. The pilgrim... 
The, the pilgrim leader's wife jolts awake in bed, gasping and drenched in sweat. The fire burns dimly now, and the wife grabs the cumbersome musket leaning beside the hearth, lights a candle, and instinctively heads to the children's bedroom. Interior cabin, children's bedroom, where her four children crowd together asleep. The candle illuminates a sight that causes her face to drop into a horrified grimace. Pennywise, naked, lithe, flesh pale and translucent, a half-formed imitation of a human, stands crouched over one child, her eyes wide, paralyzed by fear as this creature opens his maw full of razor-sharp teeth. Large razor-sharp teeth, pardon me, dripping with saliva. He jerks to the side and raises his hands, hissing at the wife as, he, as, he, as would a startled beast. Move away, devil! His voice is guttural, unnatural. You mistake me, woman. No mere devil. I am the eater of worlds. Pardon me while I get out of that voice. She <laughs> drops the candle, whose wax starts to drip and draw the flames amongst the irregular floorboards of the cabin. Move away! God protects us! Then why do you carry that musket? She Leave is innocent. <laughs> she is innocent! So you say. You have been murdering our people? I feed. You pray to God death will not find thee. You pray to me. You lie! You should have done your Arnold voice for that one. Yeah, I probably could have done. <laughs> because of Batman and Robin. You lie! No, I can't even do I can't even do Arnie. You lie. It will come out French. You lie! <laughs> the wife the wife fumbles to discharge the musket. Pennywise pinches the wick, rendering the weapon useless. She falls to her knees and clasps her hands. Take me then, devil. Take me in my children's in my child's stead. Too many bites of the apple. He looks to the terrified and speechless child, hyperventilating and covered in sweat. Look at her beautiful fear. Interesting that he, he has a certain taste for innocence here. Yeah. I think that's probably another one of um, Carrie's creepiness setting in. But that works. Yeah, it does actually here. He arches his back and cocks his head in ecstasy, ew, breathing in with a raspy sigh. <sighs> He crouches down to the child, and opening his mouth, extends a long, tentacle-like proboscis to her face as she begins to see. So he's a mosquito instead of a spider. Yeah. His eyes roll back as he speaks some unearthly tongue in a terrible, sibilant tone. The wife's nightgown catches fire, and Pennywise jerks his head to face her as she crawls to his feet. I pray thee, take me! He blows the flames out, his eyes fog over black. I will, and then her... And thy husband, and the rest of thy children, and all the savages who brought you here. And when you all rot in the earth, I will pick thy bones dry, until no meat is left to pick. And then I will seek out thy bones and consume thy souls until nothing's left but the weeds. Beat. Or you will occupy yourself otherwise and not interfere. I'll take her, and you will live, and those of thy other children in whom I take no interest— and you will thank me, fever and frost did not damn you to the soil. The wife looks at her daughter, who continues to seize violently in the bed. They're both looking at her child. She begins to weep and crawls from the room. Pennywise smiles and pauses to savor his meal. He eyes a makeshift wooden trinket around the girl's neck, carved in the likeness of a bee, yanks it off and sinks his teeth in, devouring her as the other children sleep. Interior cabin, living room. The wife crawls to the fireside and covers her ears to block the sounds from the other room of Pennywise feasting on her daughter. She stares into the fire, glowing orange like the dead lights. It's closer what she sees in it. In it. It's clear what she sees in it drives her insane. Unable to take it, she lets out the blood curdling. Exterior woods, continuous scream, echoes through the woods as the pilgrims spread out into the darkness, searching for their loved ones, only to be quickly snuffed out by the forest's shadow. Cut to interior, Kneebolt Street House, first floor, day. Pennywise holds up the pilgrim child's wooden bee trinket to his now mutilated eye, where Will gorged the poker, awash in the memories of what we just witnessed. It crushes the trinket, appearing rattled, scared even, then looks into the armoire with the scrapbook of killed children, where one newspaper in particular catches its eye. Boy, eight, drowns in storm drain in freak accident, which is accompanied by a photo of Will and Georgie wrestling in the yard. With his grimy fingernail, Pennywise scratches a little clown face on Will, in blood. I actually really like that sequence. <laughs> that actually, yeah. To me, that one works so much better than the silver dollar from the previous draft. Yes, and while I prefer the previous draft in a lot of aspects, I do think this has its moments where it really shines, like some of the interactions between the characters, some of the little moments in it. The Kneebolt Street sequence is a bit better. 
and a bit scarier. And, yeah. Um, and that whole flashback is really cool. And I like the way they frame it as Pennywise reminiscing on his past. Yeah, which works a lot better than the jarring of Ben reading the Silver Do- Dollar story in the previous draft. And this scene was in some form filmed for chapter one because there was talk about it in the test screenings and it got cut. And there was talk of, oh, it's too much. It goes too far. Oh, it doesn't fit with the movie. Oh, it, um, oh, we're going to repurpose it for chapter two, which they didn't. Which is a shame because if it's a scene you talk about so much, you want to, you want to see it rather than just discard it. Yeah. And maybe it could be in the extended cut of chapter one, which they promised nearly two fucking years ago and still haven't made. That's true. But they have said there's going to be an extended cut of chapter two. Yeah, they've said that already, which, I mean, as long as the movie is, I can kind of see where it could use a uh, an extended cut, because certain things just feel really like they passed over them really quickly. Yeah, they wanted to focus on what they deemed important. And, of course, there is a version of that flashback scene in the Dalverman revision, but it's cut down a lot, and it's mainly just Pennywise eating the child and confronting the wife, only there it's a baby. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, which is, I think, how the deleted scene from chapter one was described yeah except and there's like one screenshot from it of like scars garden like this weird makeup which i don't even know if that's legit or not who know and until we see it we can't really know for sure i mean i'd like to see it in some form it's not on the blu-ray which is why i thought it would be in chapter two but well, hopefully it'll be on the chapter two blu-ray then or the extended edition or in that Peter Jackson, we're going to cut the movies together extended cut, cut that they're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that'd be interesting, actually. Yeah, they're talking about about editing them all together so that they interleave the way the book does. Uh, so essentially, it'd be uh, they'd remake the miniseries in that regard. Yeah, yeah. Only with a worse final form at the end. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Burn. And so Will and Beverly, we see them getting ice cream together and they talk about some things. And it's here in this draft where it's made clear that Will didn't write the poem on the postcard. And he also asks her about whether those uh, dick sucking rumors are true. And she tells him that they aren't. And now, God, that's a phrase I just coined. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, you know, her father sees them together from his window, but they don't notice him. No. And so Will tries to talk to Eddie, but his mother shoes him away before they find out that his EpiPen is empty. And we also get, you know, the scene of Butch Bowers abusing Travis here. Only here it's the cattle, you know, the No Country for Old Men stun bolt gun that Travis is playing with. And Bill and Butch tries to force him to um, kill a pig with it here. But when Travis won't do it and then fucks it up, you know, he mocks him for it. And then he like cuts the pig's stomach open and spatters him with blood. And he says, all it takes is fear and some of God's good gore to make a paper man crumble. Still a good line, but much better in the film. Yeah, I like the cop thing with the gun. I think it's it's a simpler, less, you know, drawn out scene. But it is horrific the way it's described here. Oh, Christ, yeah. Especially when he start, you know, it's going to be gamey and then he just cuts it open. And he's also mocking Victor and Snatch. Take a shot. For yeah. being for being with him, and so you know we cut to, and this is, I think this is the last of Creepy Carrie's weird additions. Yeah, it is in this in this draft. It is. Yeah, and so we cut to um, Beverly's father, who here he's the janitor at the hospital, and he's approached by an elderly patient who's described as Pennywise without makeup, and it said that his ass is sticking out the back of his gown. So yes, we get to see Pennywise's bare ass in this. Was it completely over the top? See the crack in his ass? Yes. But, uh, but yeah, so once again, we get Pennywise taking on the form of a fucking person for some reason. It's, it's a, in this draft, it's a really ill defined ability of his that he just taken like random human forms. And so in this, and so this scene is just, this is another weird scene where we're not sure if we can take Pennywise as word or not. So what he says is he's talking to, he's talking to Alvin Marsh and he's saying that, you know, and it's revealed that they had an encounter years before because uh, Marsh lifts up his shirt and there's like a bite, like a huge bite mark scar on his torso. Which has just reappeared in this, during this conversation. Which is something that is a thing that happens with, you know, Derry and it and stuff that happens to you and Derry just disappears once you leave. It's part of the magic of the place. Yeah. So clearly Carrie has read the book. Oh, very much. He has paid attention, but it's just he hasn't used much of it. Oh, and I should say the whole Puritan flashback. What I like about it is that it it's not from the book, but it feels like it would fit in with those flashbacks. Oh yeah, definitely. It does feel like so, a very King touch. Okay, but here's the here's the weird thing. Apparently, 
apparently Marsh, way back when he was young, he was preying on this this 13-year-old girl. And the way Pennywise describes it, he says, you took your bite and I took mine. And he says, you owe me because I spared your life because, and he says it in a weirdly ambiguous manner. But what he's basically saying is that I spared you because I knew you would go on to rape your daughter multiple times over the years. Yeah, it, I think that is what it's hinting at, or that that's going on, yeah. That's what Pennywise is basically saying, but then Marsh says, no, I didn't do that. I've been trying to protect her from you all this time, which is an interesting angle that he was attacked. He doesn't remember it, but that's subconsciously why he is so overprotective. Yeah. But the whole thing of him going like, well, I saved you so you could rape your daughter. So the implication is that Pennywise is saying he's been raping Beverly all along. Or well, yeah, that's the implication, but then the but then script... Marsh says, Marsh says, no, it didn't happen, and the script never confirms it either way. No, and the way the interactions between Beverly and her dad earlier, it hints that that hasn't happened, but she's worried it could. It's It's all really strange, and I don't really... And bear in mind, this dark, serious shit is happening while old man Pennywise has his wrinkled ass sticking out of the back of his hospital gown. Yeah, which would have been um, wrinkly old Will Poulter ass? I don't know. I've never seen his ass. I don't know. I'm just assuming because that's who that he would have cast. So. I, I'm just ima- I, I'm just imagining like Tom Hardy following Pennywise around using his voice from The Revenant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would be brilliant, actually. So, yeah, talk about a tonal issue there. Like, I mean, it's that's quite almost, disjointed. Like, that's almost up there with some of the tonal issues in Chapter Two. <laughs> Oh God! But um, but you know, but basically, you know, he you know he gets kind of mesmerized by it and starts coming under his control. And old man, wrinkled ass Pennywise says, "Oh, she's been hanging around with boys, you know." Which yeah, which is really tw- twisting the knife in again. And so we then go to um Eddie and his mother, who they're in the pharmacy getting his pre- prescription refilled. And you know, the pharmacist just decides, "I'm going to take you off to the side into my office," which is basically what happens in the book. And he's going to tell him about how you know his, his epipen is a placebo. But the scene goes really creepier, and he's offering him like he says a grape a grape pop. And at first, I thought he meant popsicle, but he means a soda. Yeah, I, I assumed it was like a can of soda. And that threw me off because pop calling soda pop in this country is like a midwestern thing. Oh, uh, okay. At least I think it's a Midwestern thing. Around here, there are people who will call any soda Coke. So. Oh, and so pretty much if you want a tango, you're going to get a Coke. Great. <laughs> and, so that, and the scene is played really creepy. I don't know why. I suppose because they didn't do the creepiness but the full on between Dr. Keen and Beverly earlier. Yeah. But, um, so, um, but so Will, you know, he argues with his parents again, so it's the same scene, so it's still good. Yeah. It would be better if he was stuttering in some of it, but, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, when he first shouts, have it normal, and then as it goes on, he's stuttering more as he's getting more and more. Or he starts stuttering, but as he, as he starts to, you know, stand up for himself, it comes together a little more. Yeah, actually, that would work a lot better. And so he bikes away from his house in anger, and then we see Travis. You know, after he's cleaned up the mess he made in the um in the um in the abattoir, he finds the knife, the Rambo knife, in the mailbox. Only this time, there's you know dead lights in the back of the mailbox, which we still don't see. They shine on his face. Again, nice callback to the quarry. Yep, and um, we see Eddie telling off his mother, and Will arrives outside Beverly's apartment building where he sees her father come home early from work. And then their whole scuffle happens the same way as in the other script, but she runs into Will right outside. And it's actually said here that their their apartment is above the, the pharmacy, which is completely new here. Even in the script, it, it comes out of nowhere. Well, yeah, definitely, especially with a little bit later on, you know, as we hit the final stretch. Yeah, and so they get picked up by Mike and his dad's pickup truck to go to the bar mitzvah. And so the storm starts happening here again, and the kids, they come back together at the synagogue at this version. And then we get a basically identical scene of Snatch take a shot and Victor finding Travis and his dead father, only now he's saying, it's my knife now instead of it's my gun now. Yeah. And then this is where Richie gives the, the bar mitzvah speech here, which Stan gives in chapter one, but they cut it out and repurposed it for chapter two. Typical. And it's 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 different from what's on the page here. Ah, fair enough. And and it's, it's actually a really good speech about you know the indifference of people. I think I think it, it works. It, it's a really well written speech. Well, yeah, because in um, at the end of it, doesn't he look up and he sees he he sees them and 
tears are rolling down, you know, tears rolling yeah. down Beverly's face, which I think would be a nice little visual as well to bring them back together. Although I'm not 100% certain, but I think they completely reshot the speech for chapter two. Yeah, they probably... I mean, there's, cause I mean, there's a version of it that was written for, uh, that was shot for chapter one that's in the deleted scenes. That that was that was written for that's in the deleted scenes and it, it looked and sounded a little bit different to me in chapter two, but I'd need to check to be a hundred percent sure. They could have made maybe just a slight editing thing, and that's what did it. Or they probably did, as you said, because it was a deleted scene on the first Blu-ray. They redid it for the sequel. But they did they did an actual nice little character moment with that for Richie because Stan gives this because what happens is this is a minor spoiler, so it's not a big thing. But Richie is ready to just drive out of town. And as he's driving, he sees the synagogue and he goes in and it's empty and he sits down and he starts flashing back to the speech. Because you know how in the movie, in chapter one, like he's the only one who shows up for it and he's sitting there watching in the crowd? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Because, because cause they they, they, um, they kind of just go past it in the montage. They actually cut back to that and that's part of one of his, that's part, basically that flashback is basically part of his reason for sticking around. Uh, okay. But no, the speech in the script says says um he he starts to say um i guess what i like about what i read is what it says about indifference and he gets cut off when the kids show up and so he, he he picks up again later he says when you're a kid you think the universe revolves around you that you'll always be protected and cared for then one day something bad happens and you realize that's not true suns go out and animals go extinct and countries go crazy and kill people they don't like and none of it seems to matter kids get sick good friends or someone gets sick in your family or maybe you do and all that makes you feel alone like you're by yourself in a world that could care less who lives or dies where nothing counts that's why our friends and faith and family are so important as long as we have a connection to each other there's a point if we count to each other things matter we do even if to the universe we don't and in the movie it kind of he kind of goes off in a bit of a different direction and he says you know he's about how he is a loser and he always will be and that, that's what it changes into and that actually is a really good speech because it kind of taps into the way dairy kind of divides people which, yeah, it's, it's actually you know a nice little way to tap into that and to keep that weaved in as part of the story. And you can tell Carrie had just made True Detective because that's almost like an optimistic Russ Cole giving a speech. Yeah, like something from the final episode sort of thing. The final episode, which I actually like. <laughs> <laughs> I, I it, know people don't, but... it's a, well, so Some people, it's always like a Marmite sort of thing, like yeah. that kind of series. And so the the reception this time it takes place in the bingo hall and Richie has his friend step outside to apologize to him but the door closes and they get locked out locked out and that's when Travis Victor and Snatch take a shot show up and begin chasing them and they they try to get help from multiple adults but they all ignore them including um the police chief who's getting blown by the bingo caller in his car which again it's like yeah in this version it's like the police chief is nowhere near the police station he's always at the burger place and so they run into uh, Beverly's father, who's you know in the in the pharmacy below his apartment, and the pharmacist is like, "Beverly, what happened?" And he just starts chasing them too. And at one point, uh, Beverly trips, and Ben helps her up, and that's when you know he, he you know he he clues her into the fact that he wrote the poem. It's, what, it's winter fires. Yeah, he says winter fire, and she's just like, "Oh." And then they're chased, and like <laughs> she can't process it because her dad's just coming out, come back at them, followed by Travis and. Victor and Snatch take a shot. Yep, and so, okay, so they end up fleeing into the Barrens and into a sewer pipe to get away, so that goes a little bit more back to the book. And uh, Travis stabs Marsh to death right outside the tunnel, saying that, you know, you're not needed anymore, which... You've paid what? your debt. You, you've paid your debt, and so he dies here. And then Snatch take a shot and Victor, they just run off, and they survive this version, which is a rarity. I, I think from all the versions, I think it's probably the only one they do survive. You know, as opposed to uh, disappearing into a deleted scene like they do in Chapter 1. <laughs> yeah, Paul Douglas. Because cause there's a scene they cut out, which they did not repurpose for Chapter 2, where you see... Uh, where you see, uh, you see, you see Henry and the other two guys, because you see his car pull up outside the Niebold Street house, and it cuts to inside the car, and they both have their throats cut. That's right. Yeah, that's probably one of the few deleted scenes I've actually seen. Yeah, they should have left that in the movie. I don't know why they didn't. I don't know why they make a lot of decisions with, with a lot of cohesive stuff. And so, uh, you know, Travis chases the kids into the pipe and the kids follow the tunnel and they end up at the bottom of the well. And they find that there's like a big pool in the middle, which they skirt around the side of it, which is filled with children's clothes and trinkets from different eras. 
And they skirt around the pool. They continue on down the tunnel. And Travis runs in and falls in where he comes face to face with the reanimated corpse of Patrick Hockstetter. And he just starts knifing it. It, it says he specifically freaks out and starts knifing all the corpses that are popping up. Oh, and there's actually a really funny part right before that where they hear him like howling like a wolf after him going, I'm going to eat you. And one of the kids is like, is that your dad? And they're like, no, it's Bowers. <laughs> I thought that was a funny little bit, actually. It's dark. I don't think... I don't think it was supposed to be funny, but it was. It was, yeah. It's, it, on screen, depending on how they played it, it'd be one of those darkly comic little bits. And okay, so this is where it gets weird and not in the usual creepy Carrie way. Thank you, God. I just realized I was accidentally making a reference to Carrie. Yeah. <laughs> I, did, I, did, I didn't do that on purpose, but it worked. It works. Thank you, King. And so they find themselves in a tunnel, which is called the the planetarium tunnel, where it's there's like holes in the ceiling, which light is shining through them and reflecting off the water. And it makes it look like they're walking through a field of stars, which once again is a cool visual, as I'm sure you're about to say. Oh, yeah. you're stealing my lines now. Seriously, man. Yeah. <laughs> and so it would be. Will sees the paper boat floating, which maybe they shouldn't do after it already collapsed into dust. Yeah, no, it's a, it, the, you either do the collapsing into dust or you do it appearing here. You, can, you don't have it both. And so he follows it around the bend, finding himself transported to a storm drain, to the storm drain where Georgie was snatched away. And he, he sees the rest of the kids outside the drain who walk without hearing them, but they're really still trapped in the planetarium tunnel and they're looking around for them, but they can't find the bend that he disappeared around. And he finds a tiny, what's called a bile pipe at the back of the drain, which he places the boat into, and it's almost like it disappears. Like it like teleports out of his hands. And then he crawls into it himself. Which is a bit random. You think he'd climb into it holding the boat. Yeah, and so he, he finds himself inside the basement of his house. He comes out of the water in the basement. And it's like an illusion of his house, and his parents are completely oblivious to his existence. And then he sees Pennywise in the basement, who begins to chase him around the house. It's an interesting idea that Pennywise is, you know, once again, you know, playing upon his psychology here. But I don't feel like this necessarily works as a climax. No, you'd think this beat would be more somewhere in the middle of the film. It's just a little strange. Yeah. Or this would be where Bill first sees Pennywise. Like you have this bit sort of following the Georgie on, you know, the Georgie bit in the basement earlier, and then it leads into this and it's all part of his dream. Or maybe have them all trapped in their own little illusions instead. Yeah, that'd be true. Because, I mean, it kind of just makes it look like they're all unimportant compared to Will. Yeah. But no, so he's chasing them around. It's interesting because he can hear his parents, but he says it sounds like they're at, they're, they're underwater compared to him, you know, so bringing that water theme back in again. Which is a good little touch. And so, and it shows that the other kids, they're in the planetarium tunnel and they're all sort of trapped in a daze and it's shown to be like, and it pulls away from them. Like Beverly's the only one who isn't really trapped in the daze. And so it pulls away from them. It shows that they're inside Pennywise's eye, which your catchphrase. Which would be a brilliant visual. Yes, it would be. The idea that like, he's like one in the same with all these locations in Derry. It's a good visual shorthand for that. Yeah. But she eventually, you know, pulls them in t- together into a circle and once again, you know, centers them. Yeah, she she looks them she looks them all in the eyes and then takes their hands, so she's their focal point. So no train getting run here. No train, no. Always with the hands in these versions. And so that snaps them out of it, and then they see the bend will disappear around, and they start going around, and they see a light matrix of what it's called, and they see that it's shaped like Will's house, and so they're seeing him inside the illusory house, and they see him running away, only instead of Pennywise, they see an orange gas cloud chasing him. Yeah, so but... Penny... Pennywise is a Cheetah fart. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. And I think in this draft, is that the first time we see the orange yes. gas? Yeah, it's the only time we see it. it, it it's like it's, it's a holdover. It. Yeah, it's like it's a holdover from the again a random holdover from the previous. It's like they're saying that this is his true form. Almost. Yeah, <laughs> which makes a mockery of the whole spider thing, which is meant to be the true form. Kind of makes a mockery of the the deadlights too. Oh well, yeah, because I mean we built up the deadlights and now oh they're just orange gas. Yeah, it's, it's when you open a can of tango and like the you know the orange fizz comes out, and so. He's running away, and Ben ends up breaking the illusion by chucking a rock at the orange gas, and we see it affecting Pennywise in the illusion. And they all end up transported into the storm drain, 
So all eight of these people, Pennywise and all seven kids, they are all crammed into this tiny storm drain. Itty bitty living space. Which I I can't I can't picture this really. It's too awkward. Well, yeah, because you do want. Yeah, I can't even picture how you'd film it, and unless it's just unearthly large, or the storm drain runs under the whole of the pavement. Unless it's just a massively large Tim Burtonized sewer. That possibly, yeah. Expect Danny but, DeVito to walk around the corner at any moment. But so they just they just pelt him with rocks and subdue him. <laughs> Actually, you know what? You know, if, if Penguin was raised in this sewer, it would explain where all the clowns came from. <laughs> that's that's true. Actually, yeah. Well, they they do explain that in the movie, but it, it's 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 a funny joke. Yeah. But as it is, pelt the shit out of him with rocks, like like he just said, Jehovah and. Uh, <laughs> Life yeah. of Brian, anyone? The meal was good enough for him. <laughs> no one throws any single rock, t- even if I say Jehovah. <laughs> ah! <laughs> and it even, it even, um, it even, um, it even, uh, it even connects to that in the sense that Will is about to uh, crush his head with a massive rock, <laughs> and then it tries to do the uh, the thing where it tricks him into the Georgie thing again. Yeah. But the call and response thing doesn't work because the response isn't quite right. And then he looks back down, and then Georgie looks back up, and it's Pennywise's face underneath the the hood of the slicker. Which would be nice on screen. It would be a, it would be a, it would be a stunning visual. Yes, it would. And then Bill just <laughs> crushes its head with a rock, and so um, Pennywise's body collapses into dust, and the orange gas escapes and floats into that bile tunnel. I think. Is that is that one random fart escaping? Death fart instead of shitting himself like a Golgotha, he farts himself. <laughs> and so uh, the tunnels flood with water, and the kids get swept out into the quarry, which would be a stunning then- visual. Yes, it would be. And it's almost like they're trying to do the uh, the reflecting pool of the gravity reversing again, only lower budget. Yeah. And then Travis and the dead kid's bodies, they get spat out at the abattoir, and he sits, uh, he blinks and sits up from the middle of the corpses, and they, um, and one of the abattoir workers looks over at him, implying that this is how, you know, he gets framed for the, uh, the thing. And that scene actually, uh, the abattoir isn't, you know, the Bowers place in the in the movie, but that's a scene that was filmed for Chapter One, and they repurposed it in Chapter Two. Him getting swept out into the barrens with the corpses. Ah, uh, okay. So yeah, it, that would have been nice if it had actually been in Chapter One. Yeah, once again, and it would not have taken up that much time. Just like ten then, seconds at the end. And then Georgie's corpse gets expelled by itself from the sewer pipe in the barrens. Poor little Georgie. And so then it cuts ahead to September and we see Beverly's family mourning her father's death and Beverly and they're having like the wake or whatever at her house after the funeral. And so Beverly and the rest of the gang, they meet outside on the fire escape and this is where they swear the blood oath to fight it again if it ever comes back. And they're all starting splitting up again the next day. It's very, very stand by me. You expect the Richard Dreyfuss um, voiceover at this point. Which they do a sort of a, a, a visual homage to um, Richard Dreyfus in um in Stand By Me in chapter two. <laughs> uh yeah, I can't wait to see it now just to be picking out all these little references. Yeah, and so they all um and so they all split up and we get the idea that Richie has now sort of gotten over his um his his unsureness because Bill straight up says, Hey, you want my mom's playgirls? I, I thought that was quite a little funny bit, yeah. And he goes to his home, he hears his mother playing the piano again, but here it, it's more bittersweet, and they don't precisely say it, but isn't it implied here that his parents are splitting up? That's what I thought, yeah. I thought that was where actually, they were heading with this. They don't actually say it, say it. No, it's just, you go off with your dad on this trip, and we'll have our own trip at Christmas. So that kind of says, is she moving out? Is the dad moving out? And he who is he splitting the time? Yeah, it's 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 not clear. No. But um but Beverly shows up and right before he leaves she says, Hey, even if we're not best friends next year if we drift apart, you were important to me, you were important to all of us, and don't forget that Georgie loved you, which I don't think that was ever in doubt. No. Yeah, that's a line you didn't need. Just the you're important to us. And so the and so, you know, they leave in the car and then it pans up to the sky and we see a single balloon floating, but it doesn't pop. No, it just keeps floating. More ominous, this that ending. And so, and so this draft, it's stronger in some ways. The characterization is a little tighter. Some of the some some of the scenes are a little bit better written. It's a little it's a little better structured. The Nebolt House is better. The I like the uh, the flashback with the Puritans. 
Yeah. But for well, me- like, I mean, there's just, just enough things done in this that just makes me turn on it. Yeah, but to me, the the previous, the first draft, I feel is a lot better. But I do agree with you on some of the characterization. If Mike's characterization from the previous draft had been in this draft, it probably would have been a whole lot more better. And kept Stan. And kept Stan, and kept the extended fireworks fight. And kept, you know, the actual transformations and not him turning into Fly Fisherman. Yeah. And, and Henry Fonda. It's Henry Fonda and randomly vanishing and... Then him turning into Pedo-wise in the, in, in the synagogue. Into, and the random hanging ass cheeks in the hospital. Yeah, that's just like, you could pick any shape you want and you go for this weird shit. Like, I mean, I understand you're on a budget, but come on. <laughs> yeah. It's just like this one is like, oh, we've lost ten million of the budget. What do we cut? And I feel like seeing, um, seeing Eddie's, you know, seeing, you know, hearing about Eddie seeing the leper, and then seeing it when they're in the house. I feel like that works better than him just saying, "Oh, I saw it in this house," and then never hearing anything else about it. Yeah, actually seeing again what he's seen that does work better. Yeah, that that works a lot better. So yeah, this draft is, it's better in some ways. It's worse in a lot of ways. Yeah. I don't think either of these are, are are really where it needed to be. But the thing with this draft is that if he kept pushing in this direction, I'm not sure I would have really liked the movie all that much. No, although in some parts it may have been stunning visually. Of course. What ended up happening is at some point at some point in 2015, Fukunaga stepped away and allegedly, you know, he was saying, I wanted to do like this this elevated horror movie, which has become just such an annoying term because it seems like every horror movie that comes out is an elevated horror movie. Well, yeah, it's not a threat. Yeah. But then again, when you come out of the torture porn era, any horror movie is elevated. And now, now it's like, come on, just get away from the fucking ghosts, please. Yeah. But um, but but yeah, he walked away saying there was creative differences and stuff like that. New Line just wanted a generic horror movie, which I wouldn't say Chapter One is really that. Chapter One is almost more of a drama than it is a horror movie. Oh yeah, definitely. Ways, yeah. Which is what it really should be. Well, yeah, because it's that whole yeah, that whole change between childhood and adulthood is you see the world for what it is. That is more of a that- drama thing than a horror. And it also had more actual scares, whether or not you like the jump scares, than this later draft had. Mm. But here's the thing. That's what he says. However, there are certain there were certain rumblings and rumors about why he was actually let go. Is that and this I actually had to, to do a bit of um a bit of detective work on this because it was being mentioned on the IMDB forums. Ooh, intriguing. Around the, and but what happened was apparently there was a a forum that was set up for parents of child actors. And they were um, complaining about how, like, he had put a lot of this really bizarre sexual material in there. And I actually did make, I, I could only view the thread by making an account, but I actually went there to verify that this stuff was there. And it was there. They were talking about this. Apparently, they were talking about a girl describing a gang rape, being gang raped. So I'm guessing Beverly. Yeah. Beverly's father trying to pull down her panties and trying to put his fingers inside them during his assault. Oh, Christ. And here's where it gets really weird. Some of the Travis Bauer stuff. Raping a she- Travis raping a sheep. What? And masturbating onto a birthday cake. Okay. Now, I want to say I can't fully confirm that because I haven't read a draft that actually has that stuff in it. But according to what I read on that forum and according to certain rumblings and rumors, that was the real reason why Fukunaga was let go. That's really... I feel like I need a shower after hearing that. Yeah, yeah. That's just... If like that said, is I, true... I, I mean, I have no reason to think that those... That, that those parents would have been lying about it. No. But, it's, and, and, I mean, and you know, some of the stuff he does in these drafts, I can see him going in that direction. It's not a huge leap to make. Yeah. Although with the gang rape was the child actor misreading the train sequence... Well, apparently she was descri- is a scene of the character describing it happening to her. So, oh, okay, maybe her father and her creepy friends. Maybe. Mm. Yeah, I I just and I want to stress this. I have not been able to fully confirm this, but it just feels true to me for some reason. Based on what we've read in these two drafts, yeah. Like I mean, it it feels like an even more exaggerated version of this. And if that other draft 
that I've seen on lists ever get, if I get my hands on, I'll definitely be checking in for that. Cause that one is dated February something 2015. And yeah. Oh yeah. If you can get your hands on it. Yeah. Let me know. And find, we'll find out if that's the draft. Yeah. We'll find out if Travis rapes a sheep. Yeah. If that was the draft, the parents were looking at and, you know, ruins a birthday cake. Yeah. 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 Although I, that actually happens in the preacher comic. <laughs> Oh, it, seriously, well, 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 you don't see it happen, but there's a character who's known for fucking basically anything, be it animal or, or human, and it says, "Yeah, about that time of little Jesse's birthday cake." He's like, "I couldn't help but it was lying there, all all willing like." Oh my god, that sounds like an outtake from American Pie or something. <laughs> it does. Hey, you're the guy who fucked the pie. <laughs> <laughs> And it's really fun. It's really funny that that would have come out because I mean Nicholas Hamilton plays Bowers and a random bully in the Dark Tower movie. Yeah, he does. Oh god! So it's like, hey, you were in two pieces of shit. <laughs> yeah, you were in two <laughs> shitty Stephen King adapts. How does that feel? At least I wasn't yeah, in Tommy Knockers. Ugh, they should. That's one that could use a remake. Yeah. Because there's potential there. You just can't do it on a TV budget. At least not back then. No. Now, you could do it now, so it's like HBO miniseries sort of thing, or Netflix or whatever. Honestly, you don't even need a miniseries. You could do that as a movie. You don't need mm. to go into all the side characters in the town. No, but I suppose if you wanted to, you could do it as a miniseries. But yeah, you could cut, you could cut a lot of that extraneous stuff, and yeah, you got a good two, two and a half hour movie. It's it's not like it's not like need, needful things where you need all the different characters, because that's actually important. Yeah. Now that I'd like to see, even though I did enjoy the film, I would like to see that as a re, uh, remade miniseries. You see, you see, I would just like to see the actual full miniseries version of that. Is there actually a full miniseries version? It, it originally aired as a miniseries, but they cut it down for a theatrical release and put some R-rated material in it. I, ah, and I've only ever seen the movie version. Because I've seen the beginning of it on TV where Ed Harris's family dies in a car crash. I've never seen that. I've never seen the whole thing, but that does exist. Oh, wow. I have to search for that then to complete my collection. I mean, if it even exists out there anywhere. I mean, it could be just be disappeared into the ether. That's true. There could be a work print of it online. There's always a load of work prints out there. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, but, yeah, I think that... I mean, I think that covers the uh, the scripts. I could mention the, the Dauberman revision a bit, because even that has a completely different third act. Almost. Almost. Oh, God, yeah. But all, because that, all of these scripts have had a different third act to them so far. Because that has them they go <laughs> to the house to climb down the well, and Bowers is chasing Mike around, and they all sort and they teleport into what's basically a big into like either the sewers or into what's called a big black open um a a, a big black open void, which the script does describe as the macroverse, which could be good visually. Yeah, it's described as basically being a big open void. Hmm. And there's a fi- there's a well, and um, Pennywise is that carriage you see in the in the picture in the trailer for Chapter Two, where it's like the Pennywise the dancing clown carriage. Nice. That's there, and like the deadlights are like in the well, and like Bev is looking into the well, and Stan, you don't see his fear initially. You see him in the synagogue, and he looks up at the painting on the wall, which is a um, it's a picture of Judith from the from certain versions of the Bible, and she's naked and covered in blood. Oh yeah, yeah. And then when he's in the macroverse, they go into the into the carriage to try and find something to help Bev. And then the naked woman, covered in blood, comes out and starts uh, starts moving at him. That could be quite interesting. Yeah, and the whole thing with um with the uh, with the Jack in the Box Pennywise is in the, is in that carriage in that draft. Uh, okay. And, and there's some different stuff in the Kneebolt Street house. Like Penny, there's a bit where Pennywise, you know, he moves in on like a squeaky tricycle, sticks a gigantic screwdriver into a wall outlet, and then electrocutes himself until he changes into a monster. Okay, that would actually be quite funny and also creepy to see. Very Looney Tunes. Yeah, or Tex Avery sort of thing. Yeah. But no, that, but that, um, but that, um, that final draft where they're in the uh, that that third act where they're in the void, and they what they do is that they 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 destroy the physical form of Pennywise, then you see this just some, like, barely visible, like, black amorphous shape slide off and down into the well where the deadlights were. Uh-huh. Essentially, that's an even cheaper budget version of... The, the budget's just going down as we're getting through the drafts. But they changed that for the movie, and I, I do like what they did with the climax in the movie with the I'm gonna kill this fucking clown. Yeah, that was nice. And the, 
and getting to see the dancing clown actually dance. Uh, the amount of memes that you got from that. <laughs> I have no idea whether that is creepy or silly or both. To me, it's a bit of both. It's the, the look on the face and the visual around it. And he's moving like a puppet. Yeah. But the whole body moves, but the head sort of stays still. And to me, that's just the whole thing. It's just the look on the face with the music. It's sort of like you want to laugh, but you're uneasy about laughing. Yeah. So, yeah. See, I think we kind of got the best possible version in a way. Yeah. Although I will always shout for the July the 4th firework fight. And which which element, which other elements would you would you um, stay? Because I would stand up for a version of the Puritan scene. And maybe some of the crazier, more cosmic stuff that we get in here? Yeah. Oh, definitely. And um, I, know, I feel like Mike's characterization in the first draft here, just little bits of that to bolster his stuff in the film. Yeah, because at least, cause I, at least in the movie he gets a little bit of character and backstory. In this second draft, he's just like nothing. No, he's, he's just, he is literally just a token black guy. While in the yeah, pre- a- previous draft, he's... Full bl- a full blooded character. He he's a token black guy who's a scared who's scared of old chief Woodenhead. Yeah, but yeah, I think that sums it up. I mean, it makes me curious to see what he would have done for uh, chapter two. It would have been interesting, and there are bits in both drafts you could see where elements could be weaved through into chapter two, especially say in the undated draft. Then say possibly replacing Stan as the suicide victim. Well, yeah, and in, and in the data draft, you see Stan gazing into the deadlights, so that's setting up for the suicide. Yeah, so you've got all those little bits there that could eat so easily weave through. So it would be interesting to see what he would do. It would have been interesting to see what would have happened if they maybe took another year to try and work out what they were going to do with the actual movie. But Yeah, very true. And yeah. if the rumors were, you know, if he wasn't supposedly so creepy with what he was writing, you know, we might have gotten something. But yeah, I think that uh, sums up. It was it was interesting reading these. Yeah, it was actually. Yeah, yeah you know, I, I did enjoy reading them just to seeing where people could go. They were inter- they, they were interesting in that they're in this weird gray area where they're not technically <laughs> bad, but especially that second one just makes so many weird choices. It's hard to really come down where I feel about how I feel about it. Yeah, it's sort of yeah, it's like one of those where they were they were both different first drafts. Yeah, like it, it, it's almost like we're seeing two different directions. Yeah, and here we go. Here's this, like which one was Carrie's and which one was Chase's sort of thing. Well, they work together, so yeah. But if you split them apart, say because they both wrote both scripts, you could say, oh, which one was more Carrie's vision, which one was more Chase's vision. But uh, okay, so um, I think that pretty well covers it. Yeah, I think it does as well. You know, we don't go fully into the macroverse, but we touch on it more than these scripts did. Yeah, and uh, more than chapter two did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> don't worry. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, I think that pretty well covers it. Um, once again, you know, be sure to uh, send an email in to screenplayarchaeology at outlook dot com if you feel so inclined. Check us out on Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter, and um, you know, check us out on all those different platforms we've been on. I mentioned at the beginning. And um, until next time, um, and I have no idea what your next one is going to be. Maybe we'll finally do a Stanley script. Oh yeah, oh, I definitely want to. I think I definitely want to do Doctor Moreau for Stanley. Yeah, that's that one's actually that's actually a really good script. It is, <laughs> it is. So yeah. yeah, I think next time, I think next time the folks at home, the folks at home will hear me. We will be finally talking about Richard Stanley's The Island of Doctor Moreau, or Jeepers Creepers, or Jeepers Creepers. Speak, speaking of pedophiles, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Okay, on that note, um, I think, you know, hope you enjoyed it, and until next time, bye. Bye, guys.